Good morning. I'm going to call this May 1st, 2023 meeting of the Mojave County Board of Supervisors to order. Um, if you join us for an invocation given by Pastor Tony and then remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Chairman Lingerfelter, thank you, supervisors, for giving me the opportunity to pray for you this morning. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for your presence among us this morning. Um, I thank you for this wonderful country that we live in. I thank you for this system of government where we, the people, can participate. And I thank you for this great gathering of people in this room this morning. Alexander Hamilton said, I sincerely esteem a system which without the finger of God could never have been suggested and agreed upon by such a diversity of interests. And so, Father, as each one speaks this morning, help us to listen. We ask for your divine guidance and wisdom upon this entire proceedings. Father, we ask your blessings over those in attendance. We just thank you for all the things that you give to us. Help this discussions and the decisions bring you glory but be beneficial to all of those in our diverse communities. Father, I ask you to be with all of those who serve in our communities, our first responders, our healthcare workers, our teachers, our local business owners and their employees. We just ask that you keep each one safe and healthy and help our communities to continue to grow. We love you and we thank you for all of the things that you do. And we help ask you to bring our communities together and help us to support one another. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus. And thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Join us for the pledge. The pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Board of Supervisors may by motion recess into executive session to receive legal advice from the board's attorneys on any item contained in this agenda pursuant to ARS 38-431.03A34 and 7. Looking for a motion in, uh, to call for an executive session to be held May 15th, 2023 at 9 a.m. for discussion and consultation with legal counsel in accordance with ARS 38-431.03A34 a three four and seven to discuss items noticed on the agenda with an asterisk do i have a motion so do i have a second, second. for that motion and second all in favor please say aye. aye all opposed i just appear to have it do you have it so ordered official business to come before the board um attorney Estlin. nothing to report to the board thank you thank you committee and or legislative reports supervisor bishop uh, thank you. I attended the CSA Board of Directors uh, meeting. Also attended a town hall with the sheriff out in Dolan Springs. I chaired the Board of Health meeting and um, also attended the County Supervisors Association Executive Committee meeting in um, workforce, uh, workforce development as well. That's about it. Thank you. Supervisor Angus. Nothing this morning. Thank you. Supervisor Gould. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I attended the Workforce Development Board, board meeting. Um, one, um, of one of the interesting things, things that we heard, that heard there was that the uh, Mojave uh, County uh, Workforce Development uh, Board is doing a better job than Maricopa uh, County uh, is uh, at getting, uh, getting uh, jobs. Uh, we we uh, out Maricopa uh, County, and on every scalable item, we did better than our percentage of the population. So they're doing a great job and I just wanted to praise them for that. And I've got a report that st states that out. So I'll go ahead and get that out to the other board members. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. Supervisor Gould, or Supervisor Johnson, excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, uh, I attended um, the Arizona Association of Economic Development um, Spring Conference last week and also um, we had a, a very nice visit out with the residents of Al Vista a community meeting out there on Friday. Um, three, we have a, a legislative water report from High Ground. Uh, Mr. Ponder, are you on the, the line with us now? I am here. Can you all hear me? We can hear you. Go ahead and proceed with your update, please. 
Good morning, supervisors. And again, thank you uh, for the opportunity to present to the board. Uh, we are on day 113 of the legislative session. Um, as you may know, the legislature adjourned until May 3rd. Uh, so that is Wednesday of this week. Um, and there is a lot of speculation that the legislature will again adjourn after that due to some absences from legislators and, and the inability to do additional work. Um, in fact, they may adjourn to the end of this month. Um, that said, they continue to work on the budget. Um, all the information that we are getting on the budget suggests that um, they are making progress. However, um, I would I would suggest if you if you've read the read the local newspapers down here <clears throat> in the capital, as well as some of the feedback that we're getting internally, um, I think that the Democrats in both caucuses are concerned about the way the budget is being negotiated. Um, as you know, this is the first time in about 13 or so years that uh, we've had to have some sort of a uh, bipartisan budget um, dating back to, to when Napolitano was governor. And so it's a, it's a new experience for a lot of these members. Um, the way that it's being discussed right now is that Republicans in the House uh, will each have, with the one-time um, excess revenues, that the Republicans in the House will each have a bucket of somewhere in the neighborhood of $20 million to allocate uh, towards their communities uh, in the Senate, $30 million. And then the Democrats, including the governor, all will have combined about $700 million to allocate. Um, the feedback that <clears throat> was, I think, reiterated locally here was the Democrats, in a way, in the in the legislature feel like and this is not a value judgment, this is just explaining to you guys what the commentary has been, is that um, uh, they get, in, in the sense of uh, these buckets, uh, you know, they have to share in, in a collective bucket as opposed to each individual um, representative getting uh, an allotment. Um, so they're gonna continue to work through that um, and, and we'll see how that goes. I've, I think many of us have long speculated that they wouldn't be done until the end of June, until they absolutely needed to be done. Um, the discussions that I've had uh, recently suggest that they think that they could be uh, prepared with a budget um, as early as the end of this month, but um, we'll continue to monitor that. They haven't begun starting meeting in small groups to discuss any of that information yet. Um, a couple items that I'll point out is that uh, the attorney general on, well, let me back up real quick. As you all um, are likely aware at this point, uh, Supervisor Lingenfelter and myself, as well as the city of Yuma, uh, met with the attorney general's office last month uh, to discuss issues uh, wide ranging related to uh, both groundwater and river water. Um, and on April 17th, the, uh, in fact, actually, I think our meeting was at the end of March, but on April 17th, the attorney general sent a letter to the department director of the Department of Water Resources, identifying um, what she views as inaction on uh, state law vis-a-vis -vis groundwater. Um, if you look at Arizona Revised Statute 45-412 um, that was uh, that originated out of the 1980 Groundwater Management Act, it requires that the Department of Water Resources periodically review uh, all the basins in the state to determine whether or not they qualify for an active management area. And in that 42 years, the department has only uh, reviewed the San Pedro Basin, of which they've done twice, but no other basins have been reviewed. And so uh, the, the letter from the Attorney General's office uh, in part stated, um, is there a reason you haven't been reviewing the other basins pursuant to this law? And if there is, please tell me those reasons. In other words, if you're lacking resources, we need to know that. But if there's another reason, we, we need to know that as well. Um, 
The interesting point of this is that the Attorney General's office does not represent the Department of Water Resources. Um, and uh, so she is able, obviously, to write such a letter. Um, additionally, in that letter, um, and I have provided the letter to Mr. Elters. Um, additionally, in that letter, there's references to uh, the Queen Creek transfer, um, to uh, the Greenstone transfer, I'm sorry, to Queen Creek um, for the Colorado River transfer, and that the department, in, in the Attorney General's view, the department should be looking at those transfers as a collective impact and not as a one off. So it's not that they should not just be looking at 2,066 acre feet of transferred water, but the uh, the aggregate impacts of the potential for additional transfers and how that would impact not only um, the stability of the river itself, but the communities along the river. So, um, and uh, Joanna Allhands from the Arizona Republic just wrote about that, uh, and it was posted in the Arizona Central this morning. Um, and I have also provided a link to that to uh, Supervisor Alter. So um, the dialogue on these issues will not go away. I know that um, many of you have probably heard about the Department of Water Resources rescinding uh, two well drilling permits in the Butler Basin um, in La Paz County. And uh, so this just continues to elevate the issue. Um, in addition to that, the Water for Arizona Coalition, who have been allies on this issue, uh, have released um, press releases on um, uh, surveys that they've done on groundwater, uh, which find, found that only 16% of voters um, and 70 16% of voters think that the legislature and state elected officials have responded to the needs of the state as it relates to water. 75% do not believe that the state has and the difference is they aren't sure. Um, in addition to that, uh, more than 70% of the state, or I'm sorry, uh, more than, it's just over 69% of residents polled support uh, local groundwater stewardship area legislation, which is the legislation that we are supportive of, uh, sponsored by Leo Biasucci and Sonny Borelli. Uh, so that information will continue to be shared uh, with the legislature and certainly supports what we uh, in Mojave County have been doing for the last several years. Um, so a lot of positive in the way of information and news um, we're still struggling on the action piece uh, because uh, Ms. Griffin and Ms. Kerr will not allow these bills to be heard in committee, but we have attempted to communicate with the governor's office uh, and the legislature the opportunity to um, leverage discussions about uh, water as they talk about the budget. And so uh, we continue to pursue these efforts despite the fact that committees are, are over. Um, so uh, a lot will be going on. Uh, I will be meeting uh, with the Attorney General's office again this week um, to talk about groundwater specifically, and Mr. Lingenfelter will be joining me. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we have a request in to the governor to talk about um, issues along the Colorado River that would be uh, a meeting of all of the river communities, and that will hopefully happen sometime towards the end of this month. Um, so that is is my update. I'm happy to take any questions if uh, if any of the supervisors have them. Questions for Mr. Ponder. Mr. Ponder, I just want to say thank you for your efforts. Um, I also want to take the opportunity to thank uh, both uh, Coconino County Supervisor Patrice Horseman, Yavapai County Supervisor Donna Michaels, La Paz County Supervisor Holly Irwin, uh, the Arizona Republic just picked up a joint op-ed that we all submitted um, on the importance <coughs> of rural Arizona, the importance of securing our groundwater resources outside of the AMAs and the INAs. Um, and then I would just say that this board uh, is going to continue uh, to support our rural residents up and down the river and in the rural areas where 
we depend upon our groundwater resources. This board gets it. We're going to stand for our rural residents. Um, and I would say that the state of Arizona as a whole, um, when it starts to um, look out for and value the, the interests, interests of uh, future Arizona residents that aren't even here yet over the residents that already live here, um, the Arizona as a state kind of gets over its skis a little bit. It needs to worry about the Arizonans that live here right now and our future and securing those residents uh, water future before it looks out for potential residents that aren't even here yet. So um, we're doing good work and we'll continue that. Thank you. Um, County Manager's report. Manager Elters. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, board members. I have one item. Um, at the last board meeting on April 17th and during the call to the public, uh, you heard a complaint about the Messner property in uh, Mojave Valley and you were told that nothing is being done by the county. Uh, the fact is much has been done. Mojave County staff has been working on the Messner property for quite some time. After a lengthy court process in May of 2022, the property owner was found guilty on several charges. He paid fines and was given six months of probation. During that time, he did work towards bringing the property into compliance. Uh, he put up a fence, removed over 30 to 40 tons of trash and removed several vehicles and vehicle parts from all three properties. In October of 22, 2022, uh, the case was adjudicated, adjudicated um, and staff closed it. Um, However, recently, uh, Mojave County staff received a new complaint from the same individual who spoke during the call to the public at the last board meeting. Uh, staff has opened a new case and uh, is pursuing it. Uh, are working with the, uh, are looking at options with the county attorney's office and may indeed abate it uh, and lien the property uh, at some point. The reality is, for your information, is uh, that as long as Mr. Messner lives on the property, uh, the hoarding and accumulation is likely to continue and you're likely to continue to hear about it. So I just wanted you to know that much has been done, county staff has been involved, and uh, contrary to uh, what you heard during the last uh, board meeting, thank you for the opportunity to set the record straight. Thank you, Sam. We're going to move into call to the public. Um, we do have a presentation by the Arizona State Broadband Director at 10 o'clock. So um, once we get to 10, I'm going to pause call to the public. We'll have that presentation. After that concludes, we'll go back to finishing the call to the public. So first up to speak will be Scotty McClure. this at the silly cactus oh I don't know the public can see that but it don't matter anyway Ron I got I go down to your office and get the agenda and the backup on Fridays and I didn't know how to spell Valerie's uh, nickname I didn't know how to spell goofer every time I go in there she's a goofer and off so Valerie for recorder is on there whatever Okay, let's get to the TV channels. I'm still getting channel 10 on channel 17.1 and I talked to a lady upstairs and uh, this apparently is coming from Phoenix. Why am I getting, on my TV guide it says channel 10 is on 10.1. It's also on 17.1, same thing with CBS. PBS channels, they have some down there on channel eights, some on 24s, one and two and six and seven, whatever. And it's been like this for months, and I've griped about it before. 
So I guess I'm going to call Channel 10 and why are they doing this? It's not Webcom's fault, apparently. Um, this is just crazy for some of us old farts that are uh, having a hard time to figure out which channel we're on. <coughs> uh, number 39, I'm just kind of curious, is, are, is the board, the old board association suing you guys or are you guys suing them? The county, the fair, the fair board. You guys were just in there for a while. I'd like to find out who, what's going on with this. You guys have been in many executive sessions. I'm one of them that made the complaint. And I'm wondering why I come from Humboldt County in California and they even have a worse fair board than you guys did. That's why I was so mad about them over the period of years that I was going there. All they did was up the price. They never pulled a weed. I mean, whatever, you've heard all that crap before. Um, but I'd like to know who's suing who. And number 19, I think it is. Yeah, what are they doing? Um, I'm not really asking to have a poll, but what, what are they doing with your offices in the library? Uh, I couldn't get back up on that. What, what does it mean to rescind the letter of interest? That's 19 acres, that's everything you got down there. What's going on there? I couldn't get back up for it, Hildy. So. I don't know to pull it or not. Just like want to know if your office is going to be there in a month. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ken Works. <coughs> Kenny Works, Yucca, Arizona. I'm here to talk about heritage. Who's the arbiter for heritage? Who's the arbiter for uh, what is sacred? We have uh, some tribes that uh, wanna declare our uh, area where our minerals are located as uh, sacred monuments so that uh, we're not allowed to extract uh, our minerals. Well, what I find sacred is prosperity. That's what my ancestors found sacred is prosperity. And uh, since for the last two and a half years, it's obvious that uh, that's not the way it's going to be with this present administration, both in Washington and in Phoenix. They're both against anything that's uh, sacred as far as prosperity goes. They're doing the exact opposite. Monuments. Here's a picture of a monument set up in uh, Arlington Cemetery. Right now the administration is ordering it to be torn down. It was designed and constructed by a Civil War soldier. His name was Ezekiel. Was Moses Ezekiel was his name. He was a student at VMI, a cadet at VMI, when a, a major uh, battle was taking place near there and uh, they, he was taken into battle and they uh, succeeded and they prevailed in that battle. Here's his picture. Moses Ezekiel, that same soldier, designed and built that monument and the administration is ordering it to be taken down. The person in charge is this general, Ty Sedgwell is this general's name. I've called our, our congressman and both senators and asked that he be fired. His sigil has gone along eagerly with the revised historical orthodoxy revised historical orthodoxy. Who's doing the revision? Well, this is, this is the sort of thing that 30 years wars are made out of. I think that uh, the present administration is doing everything they can to destroy us. And we need to be active and do what, everything we can to stop them. And that includes making a monument out of the uh, Grand Canyon areas, area so that we cannot extract minerals. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 
We're going to move into the, the presentation by Arizona State Broadband Director Sandy Bomick. Uh, he's going to give a presentation on the Arizona Commerce Authority's bead grant program. Um, Director Bomick, are you on the line? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself and then I'll just go ahead and let you go ahead with the presentation, Director Bomick. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for the opportunity and thank you um, all the board members uh, for giving me this opportunity to present uh, the broadband vision and ideas from Arizona Commerce Authority for next five years. Um, I would like to quickly introduce myself. My name is Sandy Bomi. Um, I'm the state broadband director at, here at Arizona Commerce Authority, primarily responsible for broadband deployment, grants management, uh, and any federal or local grant um, uh, deployment regarding the broadband infrastructure project. Also responsible for any digital equity related project, uh, which would be which will be an application on top of the broadband um, infrastructure. My background is in uh, electrical engineering. I got my master's and bachelor's degree in electrical and telecommunication. Uh, worked for AT&T, Verizon, Crown Castle, Comcast, mostly telecommunication company related to what I'm working on right now. Um, served in the United States um, Army Reserve, uh, former uh, military of, um, US Army officer, and uh, retired last year. Um, in my defense side, I worked with the telecommunication and satellite systems, which basically um, <clears throat> created a, a, a secure infrastructure communication between uh, outside bases, uh, out, bases outside of United States. Um, with your per permission, Mr. Chairman, um, I would like to share my slides and uh, talk quickly and briefly about the broadband initiatives, what Arizona Commerce Authority is currently working on and would love to have questions or any follow-ups, anything after that. And more about the, the, the regional partnerships that you're gonna be um, forming. I know that you and I have had a Teams discussion. Um, we also had Keith Watkins from Rural uh, Arizona Commerce Authority. Um, can you talk about that process a little bit more and, and how Mojave County can work in, in getting the right people together to work with you in this region? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> sir, um, the, so, so far from Arizona Commerce Authority uh, during last one and a half year and in coming years, uh, we are working on two major broadband connectivity grant or infrastructure grant. One was the ARPA money, which came directly to the states. Arizona, state of Arizona received $190 million. $100 million was assigned to broadband infrastructure project. Uh, we ran that project last year and selected 20 projects out of 87 application. Um, happy to share, and as you probably know, that uh, we come at Mojave County is one of the recipients for that uh, grant funding. One, uh, another big uh, chunk of the broadband funding, which is in the pipeline right now, is from IIJA. So the bid funding allows us to deploy massive scale of broadband connectivity projects here in underserved and unserved communities in the state. And we are going through a planning process to get that, to receive that money. The IIJA basically dictates or mandates that the state we'll have to document all the underserved and unserved household businesses anchor institute as part of the plan. And also the plan should dictate that how we will deploy this network, distribute this grant money based on the FCC public map um, uh, and submit that to federal uh, government slash NTIA before we start deploying this uh, funding. Arizona, state of Arizona uh, should receive, uh, the, the final figure is not um, out yet, but the state of Arizona should receive somewhere between 650 to $750 million. And then there will be a 25 percent matching on top of that funding, which takes us close to billion dollar uh, in deployment. Um, 
community engagement or stakeholder outreach one of the crucial part of this deployment. Uh, federal government or NTIA as part of the NOFO dictates us to go and actually present our vision for every single county, every single cities into that particular community and listen to the stakeholders, which is the resident of that community. Uh, what do you want to see from your standpoint? Who's your provider? What kind of speed you are getting? Those are the direct stakeholder engagement and the communication we'll be receiving, which will be integrated is as part of this plan. And Arizona Commerce Authority recently um, started planning out a statewide community outreach tour. So um, in Mojave County, we'll be doing something same like that too. We would like to stop by in churches. We would like to stop by in libraries or any other community anchor institute to talk about broadband with the residents. Um, we are hoping that there will be few key people for every single county who will show us direction because you know your community better than anyone. So we would like to rely on your expertise that which community, which places to stop by, uh, where, what should we talk about? Uh, the current broadband situation, current broadband infrastructure situation, uh, if it's well enough, uh, what can we do to improve that situation? Uh, also, any digital equity, telehealth, um, uh, job training, workforce development, how can we help you from the broadband standpoint? So putting together a, a quote-unquote broadband advisory council from a county's perspective would be a great uh, decision at this point that we will, Arizona Commerce Authority will have a single point of contact that we can contact and it's the stakeholder engagement and also listen from the community. Also, it would be helpful for us to get the communication, get the news out when the Commerce Authority broadband team will be on the ground, uh, will be on ground and ready to listen to the people or any kind of uh, stakeholder engagement, any community town hall. This is going to be an ongoing process for next five years before and after deployment. So it is very crucial for the state, uh, for the residents, for every single household or citizens here in the state. So um, it would be a great initiative to start with, uh, but um, sir, I'll rely on your expertise and uh, your community uh, engagement process to select and probably give us some names that who that person would be. the bead grant funding, the intent of that is to push fiber broadband connectivity into areas that are typically a, a little more rural, that, that don't pencil um, privately by themselves, if, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and and our, our supervisors, they know their districts better really than anybody. Um, and I, I know they have those areas that would benefit um, from bead grant. We've had some success already with TCN and with WECOM and ALO and some of our other providers that are bringing us really the fastest broadband in the state of Arizona. Um, we want to just make sure that we uh, are positioned to work with your office to continue to push forward on the broadband fiber. So are there any other questions for the state broadband director? Thank you for your time this morning, sir. I appreciate it, sir. Um, if there is any other question I can take from the board members or the resident would be great. Otherwise, I would like to, um, if, Mr. Chairman, if you permit, I'd like to share a quick presentation of the four major projects we are handling right now. Um, it should not take more than five to 10 minutes. Sir. Mr. Chairman, I want to uh, make sure that everyone can see my screen. Uh, we don't see it yet. <laughs> we, there we go. Yes, it's up now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, this is a very brief and quick update on the four major projects State Broadband Office um, is currently handling. Um, so the first one is the Arizona Middle Mile Broadband Network. Um, if you remember, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, back in 2019, we ran our first broadband grant project. It was a $3 million grant project, and Mojave County, Mojave Electric Cooperative was one of the recipients of that project. Uh, during that project, uh, during that deployment of $3 million, we discovered that there is a huge gap 
between the last mile and the middle mile network. Uh, just for uh, knowledge purposes, the middle mile network is basically the main backbone of a network which connects the households and the businesses uh, with the fiber. So after discovering that fact, the state um, uh, Arizona Commerce Authority started looking into different options. Uh, we hired a consultant back in 2000, end of 2020, and started working on a Arizona middle mile broadband network. Um, the consultant group released a public, uh, public um, middle mile broadband plan in February 2022. And here are some key found findings we found during this uh, feasibility study. We found that a large majority of the population in Arizona resides within five miles of the radius of the interstate and state highway network. Out of that, out of that population, 70% of them are unserved or underserved. When I talk about unserved or underserved, uh, unserved means anyone who has less than 25, 25 Mbps download, um, 25 Mbps download and three Mbps upload in their households. And uh, underserved means anyone who has less than 100 Mbps download and 10 Mbps upload um, uh, in their households. So we found that 70% of this unserved and underserved population lives within the major interstate high, highway, major, in, major interstate and state networks. So, and during this uh, feasibility study, we found out that interstate 70, interstate 90, and interstate 40 appears to be more, the most critical in terms of the priority because we found most of the underserved and unserved households are through this corridor. So what the state broadband office here at SCA did, we partnered up with Arizona Department of Transportation to use their right of way to deploy a broadband middle mile network, which will uh, support the last mile deployment. Uh, at that time, we did not know about any anything about ARPA funding, or we did not know anything about the bid funding uh, out of IIJA. Uh, state of Arizona is one of the state in the nation right now, which uh, is leading the whole country uh, when it comes to the broadband middle mile network. It's uh, other two states are following the same path, Georgia and Pennsylvania, but we're the first one in the uh, in the country to deploy this kind of network, which will support our last mile effort when it comes to bid funding. Please do note that the bid funding does not support any investment into the middle mile network. So this will definitely come handy when we are talking about the bid funding, and you will definitely get benefited out of the um, uh, interstate 40 middle mile network. Um, so here are a few quick updates. So we have I-17, which is uh, Phoenix to Flagstaff. Construction is underway right now and estimated to be completed in June 2023. Same thing for I-19, Tucson to Nogales. It's uh, estimated to be completed in June 2023. I-40, Flagstaff to California border, uh, announced in um, uh, February 2022. Construction will start at the end of this year and expected to finish in 2025. Um, I-40 East, it's currently under discussion right now, and we are hoping that there will be a positive news pretty soon. Um, what, are, what are the main um, um, uh, lucrative point of this middle mile network? All this middle mile network will have seven micro ducts. Just to explain that in a simple language, seven micro ducts means seven different pipes um, combined together. Each micro duct can support 288 fibers. Um, just an FYI, all the households along I-40 or any other interstate highway can be supported just with one micro duct. We are thinking about future and we are actually putting six more extra micro duct that this network can be there for next 100 years and support the communities with the growing need in the connectivity. There are pool boxes in every 3,000 feet. That means if you compare that with your household, um, uh, with your household, if you um, if you deploy a um, electric line all over your household and there is no outlet to connect your phone or light systems or anything else, that is definitely not convenient. So what we are doing, we are putting an outlet in every single 3,000 feet that any community who wants to connect their community using this middle mile network can have very easy access. 
Of course, the state or Arizona Department of Transportation owns this network, but we are not a network entity. So we would like to we we thought of hiring a operations maintenance and commercialization entity who will be managing this network for 25 years. We published an RFP last year. Uh, we got multiple proposal. This is a multi-million dollar, multi-year contract, and an evaluation team is currently uh, reviewing those applications. We're hoping to get um, a part, we are hoping to get a vendor uh, for state of Arizona in next one or two months. Um, so, and we will start commercializing this uh, this middle mile network. I'll just stop here and see any of the any of the audience, uh, Mr. Chairman or member of the board, has any questions. Go ahead and proceed, sir. Yes. Yes. Got a question over here. Uh, we're not taking um, audience questions right now. We're just going through the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There'll, there'll be an opportunity for those things in the future. It's not a. It's not a. Sir, go ahead and, and continue your conversation. Your presentation. Thank you. So um, this is the Arizona Broadband Development Grant, which we um, uh, we went through the program last year. Uh, this is the $100 million investment we did through uh, the ARPA dollars the state of Arizona received. Uh, uh, in a nutshell, we received 82 proposals um, across the state, 67 from rural counties, 15 from urban, which is Maricopa and FEMA counties. 20 projects were recommended uh, for funding by a multi-agency evaluation committee. Um, uh, we allocated $75.7 million to 14 awardees in rural counties and $23.6 million to six awardees in urban counties. Out of that $100 million investment, we have received a $112.8 million local match uh, in funds. Uh, published an RFP, selected this project last year and announced everything on last fall. Um, February this year, uh, U.S. Treasury approved our $100 million portfolio. Uh, where we are right now in the process, we are going through some compliance-related um, requirement with U.S. Treasury, um, and all the other states are going through the same process. Once we hit that compliance milestone, we'll start deploying this fund. Um, in a quick overview, this, is, this will be the outcome of that $100 million investment. So we made a total investment of $213 million. We are deploying almost 3,300 miles of fiber in 73 communities. 480,000 people will be served, and 105,000 households uh, will be served in this whole uh, deployment. Uh, 22,000 businesses will be served, and 734 community anchor institutes, which includes critical infrastructure, sheriff's station, um, hospitals, libraries, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we are hoping to roll out this money in next one and a half to two months. And let's have a look at the IIJA, um, what we'll be receiving out from IIJA. So this is the overall funding um, federal government, government assigned to the IIJA Broadband Connectivity Fund. The big part is bid funding. We are talking about the first uh, tab here. The bid funding allows $42.5 billion for all 50 states and US territories. And this money is definitely not going to distribute it, uh, get distributed based on uh, the state's population or equally getting distributed between all the states. It depends on how many underserved and unserved households we have in the state. Based on that calculation, as I mentioned before, Arizona is um, well um, aligned to receive somewhere between $700 million. Uh, and then the next part is digital equity um, grant, which to promote telemedicine, um, uh, distance learning, workforce development, uh, other sort of connectivity project um, in the state uh, after that big deployment. State of Arizona should receive somewhere between 65 to $70 million for next five years to deploy this kind of 
program related to telehealth, distance learning, um, workforce development, uh, digital equity, community college partnership, um, technical um, uh, courses for uh, youths after um, after the high school related projects. Uh, these are the tribal funding. If you have any tribes in your community, they will be directly receiving this fund from um, state government, uh, federal government. We are communicating directly with them. So far, a state of Arizona tribes received $165 million, which is separate from this, uh, this bead funding. And this is the middle mile network. Um, we submitted total three applications on the middle mile network. All of them are under review right now and hoping to hear back from the federal government by um, in the beginning of fall uh, regarding any of the Arizona Middle Mile Network will be, uh, will be benefited out of this thing. Um, so <clears throat> how the BEAT program works closely with, with Digital Equity Act, any community federal government as part of the IIJA uh, mandates that any community we are deploying high-speed broadband we have to deploy another layer of application, which will uh, make sure the communities here in the state, even though the most underserved community, most rural community is also getting the same equal opportunity, the people who are getting here in Maricopa County and Pima County, that's the ultimate target. So we would like to go to the communities and listen to you all to make sure that we're documenting your needs in this whole process. And we are deploying those application after we deploy the high-speed broadband internet connection. So here's the timeline, and we need your participa uh, participation in this Director process. Bovic. So, sorry. Um, can you wrap up your, we, um, one more minute, I'll give you to wrap up the, the presentation, if that's okay with you. Yes, sir, uh, this is my last slide. So uh, this is a quick um, glance at, that, um, at the timelines. Uh, we are currently going through a uh, five-year plan development before we receive the funding. I will share that presentation with, um, with you, Mr. Chairman, um, so that we can expect your participation into this whole process. Uh, this, was my, this was my whole presentation. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, for your time. And, um, I appreciate this opportunity and uh, thank you all the members of the board and looking forward to work together, looking forward to listen um, what the community has to say. And we're here for the help. Uh, Arizona Broadband, um, Arizona Commerce Authority Broadband team is growing. So any feedback you have for us, uh, we are definitely here to listen. Uh, so I would like to thank you, uh, Mr. Keith Watkins. He's our um, Rural Economic Development Senior Vice President. So we're always going to be in touch and please let us know if there is anything we can do from our end at this point. Otherwise, we'll see you soon. We look forward to working with you. Okay, we'll go back to the call to the public now. Uh, Mr. Erwin Myers. My name's Erwin Myers. 20 years ago, I came over to Keeneland and I was looking for a place to retire when I got up in age. And five years ago, I made that commitment and came here. And I've seen a lot of changes between the 20 and the five. And it seems like the town has really, really not improved too much. It's overpopulated. And back to this water problem that we have. And, uh, you know, you keep building and building. Where's the water going? People are using it. So we're at the point that we got to charge more money now for the water. But one of my main complaints is I moved out to Golden Valley in November. And I purchased a property out there. I signed up with the utilities and the electrical company uh, sent me an email with the wrong address. And I'm getting billed three times I'm getting billed three hundred dollars. I'm going so I call them up and they said, No, that's your that's and I said, No, it isn't. I asked them where's the meter at? Well it's on the property. Well that address that they're charging me for is not the address that's on my property. So again, 
they had to blame the city of Kingman for it. Why would the city of Kingman be blamed blame for something that they put a meter out there on the property? And <clears throat> there's a lot of issues that I have with this town, and I'm kind of concerned what's going on here. The courts, the different different places of business I have to deal with, and I got to do something three or four times before I get it done right. And I'm just concerned with the way things are going here. And I'm going to get myself up until 2000, I mean, the year 2024. And if things don't improve, I'm going to sell my property and get out of Dodge. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sarah Carter. Good morning. I have um, a question. I have two of these. I'm not sure which one you want me to start with. Uh, we're on the yellow form right now. The yellow one? Yep. Thank you. All right. My name is Sarah Carter. I represent Golden Valley Water. Uh, forgive me. I'm a little bit uh, nervous here. So I represent... Golden Valley Water, which is a commercial water hauling uh, business down in the valley. I, I'm here to represent also the other commercial water haulers that are down in the valley. So um, over the past several years, the commercial water, ha water haulers have been having an increasing issue with the residential water haulers pulling water from the commercial standpipe. The commercial water haulers have two issues with this. The first is that the commercial water haulers pay a much higher deposit to pull water from the commercial standpipe, while the residential water haulers pay a smaller deposit, yet they can still pull water from the commercial standpipe. Mr. Chairman. The second issue with this is that the yeah. residential water haulers- I believe this is on the agenda, is it not? Right, I think it'd be appropriate yeah, the um, call to the public is to ad 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 address issues that are not on. So it would be this one then that I would. Well, uh, um, if you have something that you'd like to share with the board that isn't on our current agenda today, um, that's what the call to the public is for. If you want to talk during an item, then that's when you would sign up for an item and, and that item is pulled and then we go through and we, we address everybody's request to speak for them on that item. Does okay. that make sense? Yes, of course. So, um, so if you, what if, I was speaking was, was out of content. This one, of course, is within what's going on uh, with the agenda. Um, if you want me to speak within this well, I, I believe that this item is on our agenda. So if, we, if okay. we can just have you wait until the agenda comes up and we'll speak, we'll, we'll call you back up at that time if that's okay with you. Okay. All right. Great. That's, Thank you, ma'am. Sounds great. Appreciate Thanks. it. Uh, Joy Bancroft. Good morning, Chairman Langenfelter, Board of Supervisors, Mr. Elters, Mr. Esplin. Good morning. I'm here again to call to the public as our opportunity to make sense of that April 3rd decision to approve three to two, the resolution and agenda 52 and 53. It was um, resolution 2023-063. I have here with me today some residents who want to speak on the facts again of the objection of the proposed change as it relates to the rezoning. Each has a different point to make. We don't have any repeat like we had 50 people here, you know, a month ago. Um, but first, I have some considerations and thoughts. It's been almost a month and I know some of the supervisors have been flooded with emails and letters. So now I wanna ask if you think you did the right decision with your yes vote. 
Do you think that Leo Basucci as an owner or part owner of the parcels had any impact on your election or your decision? Do you think you had a chance to stand? If you had a chance to stand next to the parcels, would you want to live next to that project? Um, I did this second grade cut and paste. <laughs> call it my second grade cut and paste and in the middle is the project that would impact all of the area around there Where should I? there you go thank you so the middle is the new proposed um, project I'll leave it at that but I ask you would you want to live next to that would that be something you want to live next door to Do you think the project is really a good fit for the community? Two of your supervisors thought that it was not a good fit. Do you think, Supervisor Gould, you made the right decision when all your constituents were in the room passionately with their objections? Do you still believe that residents had preconceived opinion against the project after the developer didn't offer very, or did, didn't offer at all very limited answers to the questions. Do you think the residents within the zoning area of the project in Golden Shores Parkway received fair notice of the hearing and an opportunity to protest on behalf of um, that, more than half of those people are weekenders and people who don't come to Topak that often. So they had no P.O. box, they didn't receive the letter. Almost more than half. Do you think we're gonna go away quietly? This is not my attitude, I'm trying not to throw attitude at you. I'm a reasonable and objective person, but my heart and passion tells me that we need to keep fighting for this. So um, my last thing is, if I may, Mr. Lingenfelder, one thing. That's fine, I'm gonna be pretty strict on the time though because we just have a ton of Could comments. you please reconsider your yes votes and bring it back to an agenda item, please, please. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Jennifer Esposito. Jennifer Esposito. Crystal Turby, you're on deck. <clears throat> Truby, excuse me. Jennifer Esposito, candidate for District 4 County Supervisor. Long time no see. I'm sure that uh, we can all agree that Life is better when I don't have to come down here and discuss things with you. But since I do have to come down here on another matter, I thought I would take a moment to revisit why I had to come down here meeting after meeting after meeting, which was during the scandemic. Um, I'm sure that you're aware that Dr. Mengele, I mean Dr. Fauci, has already assured us there will be another epidemic, pandemic, Pandemic. But Chris Rodarty was really insightful to point out to you guys that um, under an emergency, Arizona Revised Statutes 36-787 grants some really frightening uh, powers to the county health department director. Now, we didn't have one that was qualified last time, and you know, I'm glad that you hired someone that did. But, uh, and I would like to take this opportunity to wait for a moment, pat myself on the back for being 100% right about absolutely everything, hindsight being 2020, and the health director was absolutely wrong on everything. And a lot of us were right, but we had no voice. And we asked that you look into that statute. Now, you can't override a state statute that grants authority, but you could have, what we asked for was that you put in some oversight for decisions, maybe, you know, if, if a decision is made or something that it be effective for a period of time. I don't see anything in the statute that says it's indefinite, but you know, that you, that you basically have oversight rather than have a unelected person have that much authority for that long. I mean, this board allowed the previous health director to criminally target, I don't know, I, I think it was 70 something businesses, maybe more. I never wanna see this ever 
happen again. And I would hope that maybe in my absence, you've done something to look into that. Another thing that I asked for was that uh, you compare the uh, deaths by all causes uh, statistics, because I couldn't find them at the time on the State Health Department website. And we now know that uh, I was right about that too, and that COVID-19 was less deadly than the flu. So, um, you know, I hate to come here and follow up, but since I had to come here, I'm just following up. And I hope that before Fauci is right, that, you know, maybe there is something that we could do. And I would really appreciate if you would look into it for the uh, benefit of everybody in the county. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Crystal Truby. Good morning. Um, I'm Crystal Truby. Um, I'm asking for a revote to resend, resend the zoning changes of items 52 and 53 to not allow the adoption of the RV park concert venue and RV storage in Topot Golden Shores. Within the rezone notice of hearing letters that were mailed out by Jeffrey Farr, I also have a copy here to show. The, later, the letter states... <coughs> The enclosed vicinity map is included for your reference. There were no homeowners that had a map included within their rezone notice. We ask that you deny this rezoning immediately on the grounds of improper notification and inadequate due diligence. I personally went door to door to visit every homeowner within the 300 feet. 100% of them are against this project. I gathered six more signatures that I have here to submit to the clerk. Is this enough for now for a four-fifths vote? Of the 51 parcels, there are 22 vacant on lots who are not physically present to sign petitions. Because no homeowners received a map, they are unable to make an informed decision. Homeowners who own more than one property said they were only given one notice. An unknown number of rezone notices sent to property owners were mailed to street addresses and returned to sender. This is our last resort before taking legal action, a road we would like to avoid. If needed, we have secured legal counsel in preparation. This is a fight to preserve our way of life. Mojave County needs to be aware of questionable relationships between developers, county assessors, board of supervisors, and members of the Arizona House of Representatives. Help us fix your reputation before more people start to lose trust in your leadership. I do thank Travis Lingenfelter and Buster Johnson for their votes against the rezoning, and thank you to the commission for their unanimous vote to deny the changes. The disrespect shown to the commission members from Ron Gold, Haley Ingus, and Tim Walsh at the meeting on April 3rd was unprofessional and arrogant. It's the same arrogance that Ron Gold and Hildy has shown to our community. In May of 2018, there was a board meeting for the then proposed Riverbound, the same developer as the one here, but within Havasu Heights. Once again, this developer picked land that would need rezoning. Buster Johnson put up a very good argument on why not to allow the zoning changes to change from industrial to general commercial. Despite all his facts, Hildy was the first to vote in favor of the developer. We know what it's like, Buster, to not be heard. At least Hildy's seat will be open soon for new prospect. Hildy says this is a good addition for our town. Tell that to our homeowners who feel they have been gut checked and are sick to their stomach and don't know if they're going to have to move. You have been publicly endorsed by Leo Biasucci to take over his seat. He is the landowner and member of this develop it, development. It is unethical and a conflict of interest. Both you and Leo Biasucci should be reviewed for unethical violations. Jean Bishop, you have said you just go along with whatever the district supervisor wants. This is poor leadership. We believe you are better than that. We urge you to bring item 52 and 53 back up for consideration. Okay, do Thank I have you, to? That's it? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Rick DeShinger. Rick DeShinger. I have about two or three hundred more signatures. Based on that same thing, can I? You can send hand those to the clerk, please. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. Board president, board members, and staff. My name is Rick Dishinger. I am a full-time resident of Golden Shores since 2009. 
First, I'd like to thank Mr. Johnson and Mr. Lingenfelter for their positive vote in denial of the rezoning request that we've been talking about today. Your comments regarding your decisions for a no vote were spot on and rewarding and you valued and listened to our zoning commission or your zoning commission in their unanimous vote of denial. Their vote came after listening to the many concerns brought forward by the citizens of our town. At that meeting, prior to the vote on item 53, Mr. Walsh was asked about how the zoning commission thought process worked, and he said he could only speculate that they voted due to emotional factors. That was false. Ms. Angus, you should have recused yourself from the vote due to the fact of receiving an endorsement from the landowner, Mr. Piasucci, just prior to the meeting in question. How is that not a conflict of interest? Had you done any homework at all, you'd also see the players you're supporting quite a cast of greed. Mr. Gould, you made a, rep a comment in your reasoning for your vote about how would we like 680 houses. I can tell you every single person I have talked to said they would embrace houses instead of this horrendous project because it would bring real community members, bring their children to our school, bring revenue to our business and job opportunities in the community. And it would not look like a god awful metal storage facility inside our neighborhoods. Do you want it next to your house? Is this reasonable property development? Ms. Bishop, you indicated you don't vote on emotion, but on facts. Well, our latest water report from the Golden Shores Water District, or Water Company, states we have two main wells, one of which is shut down due to arsenic levels exceeding standards for consumption. Also in the ADEQ report on this same well, it outlines dangerous levels of arsenic, barium, chromium, fluoride, nitrate, and sodium. So do you think this project might add to our aquifer these and other nefarious chemicals? Because every RVer, razor owner, boat owner, I know maintains their equipment by washing it down. What is Mr. Rodney's plan on mitigating that runoff? Not into his glorified septic system, I am sure. Yes, we realize the zoning is one component of this project and many other hoops must be traversed. But so far our community is seeing little or no faith in a government entity that is not using common sense. Why put a project like this right inside a community that will affect it in so many negative ways? A private concert venue, biker bar, restaurant, a pool, a fueling station. I can guarantee you if this came to each and every one of your neighborhoods, you would be outraged. Again, we're asking for one of you to bring back item 52 and 53 from the April meeting back to a floor vote. This is our chance for an appeal as you have told us without litigation. We have consulted an attorney, do the right thing, bring this back, revote, and support your planning and zoning commission and deny the rezone. And please bring on the houses. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Chris Rodarte. Chris Rodarty, Mojave County taxpayer. In July 1776, our founders penned the following as the introduction to our Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Today, as I dust off yet another old, archaic, moth-eaten founding document for your consideration as it pertains to, well, just about everything on this and countless other board agendas, I am struck by how far we have strayed from the very foundational principles on, upon which this country was built. We Mojave County, Arizona, bright red bastion of freedom that we claim to be, have abandoned our principles in favor of the progressive ideology of diversity, equity, and inclusion. <coughs> Case in point, today's presentation of the ACA bead grant translated as broadband equity 
access and deployment. Yet another wealth redistribution scheme designed to funnel taxpayer money into the coffers of bureaucrats under the guise of serving constituents. This grant program assumes the poverty-stricken rurals need a hand up, a handout, internet access for all, Daddy Warbucks style government assistance devised in order to communicate on the worldwide interweb. In 2023, everyone, even the poorest, most underserved, disadvantaged among us, carries an internet connecting mini computer in our pockets. Why must we grovel for more government cheese to fill imagined gaps in service is a mystery to me. But hey, Mojave County, why not? Everybody's doing it, so why shouldn't we? If we don't queue up now, we'll get left behind, right? We deserve that wealth redistribution money because, you know, COVID and, you know, other stuff. I'm on the edge of my seat anticipating the results of the bead presentation today. I can't wait to see what happens next. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Wayne Hollins. Wayne Hollins. Good morning, Chairman, Supervisors. <clears throat> I attended the free trash day on Saturday <clears throat> from the beginning to end. Uh, I think it went pretty well. Couple, couple hitches there, but not anything to do with the county, mainly the residents, but uh, some, some comedy also, like a one tired trailer and that type of thing out there. But overall, it went really well. And I thank the ones who ran the thing for extending the hours of it to get everybody in there. And I think 385 people going to the dump that day was, was an extraordinary amount. So I, I appreciate all that. And it was it was a fun event. I, the the uh, landfill had it all set up really nice when I got there in the morning and dumped my load, but I was there at the very beginning, so I don't know what it looked like at the end, but I think, you know, I, in my opinion, it was a very good success there. <clears throat> and then back to the water. We got Queen Creek now being able to get that water, and it goes back to the same thing I've said before. What did they do with their water that falls on their head before they want water from the river? And by the same standard, we're doing the same thing. Not enough. If, it, if we have 220,000 residents in the county and we each use 200 gallons of water a day, that's 135 acre feet a day. So over a year, that's only 50,000 acre feet of water. Your book here says that if we get just five inches of rain over the whole county, that's 3.59 million acre feet. So is water that much a problem? Groundwater, yeah, we need to get more water into the ground, but spending $22 million to put 1,100 acre feet into the ground doesn't seem like a wise choice of money and it's going to take a heck of a lot of money to get that just the 30,000 acre feet that were short in the uh, Wallapai Reservoir. So maybe we should use more of the water that falls on the ground and incorporate that into the ground. And it's not only you, you guys, the people who live here can do a lot to put that water into the ground and use it so they don't have to draw the groundwater. So it's not, it's not all government problem. It's our problem. We all live here. So we all need to work at the same goal is to use our water wisely and keep it. There's no reason why we can't do most anything we want if your figures are correct. So I, I would, again, I'm trying to teach everybody I can, but we could use some help with the education. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sil Rosendahl. Good morning. I guess it's still morning, right? Okay. 
Open it this way. Okay, I'm thinking I'd like to ask you for reconsideration on the April 3rd rezoning vote for items 2023 62, 062 and 063 for um, 169 acre Telos Venture Partners LLC. There's three major dilemmas with this rezoning and it's located on historic Route 66. First, this project location does not fit the community and the Mojave General Plan has been altered. Facts were stated regarding the infrastructure challenges and our county sheriffs are overburdened and understaffed and can barely police the community since we are nine miles from the nearest substation. Sheriff Schuster asked on April 3rd to increase his budget as Mojave County has the lowest wage for sheriffs, 23 to $33 max per hour for long shifts, 180 plus RV sites that are going to be open to rent nightly like an Airbnb coming into our town bringing another set of new um, problems. The concert venue alone that has no support for the attendees, there are no hotels, no public campgrounds, no restrooms, only the open desert and no trash pickup. How will you handle the increased crowds? Second is an ethical point. Citizens need to have trust and confidence in elected officials and hope they act in the best interest of the public they serve and to be fair and unbiased by putting public interest before personal gain. Our state legislator, Leo Biasucci, purchased this property knowing the development could not be built unless he resigned. You as a board disregarded the unanimous rejection of the Planning and Zoning Commission. You did not do your homework on this matter with the 69 letters and 30 emails and a petition of over 200 signatures in opposition sent to you before April 3rd. You closed the public forum early to the speakers. Our representative, Supervisor Ron Gould, swiftly moved to approve this. Hildy Angus quickly second the vote. She is running for the office that the state legislator Leo Basucci now holds. He endorsed her publicly days before this vote and Ron Gould has now approved three projects by the same developer. So for this politician and business partners to gain the opportunity to build this development in a rural area next to residential homes in a, and a school and to next to protected land is something to be scrutinized. Third, it is an, an environmental impact on the tribal BLM land and Havasu Wildlife Refuge within the Topak Marsh and Goose Lake. The sewage treatment plant fueling station and a concert venue which alone could destroy the habitat for the species that reside within 500 feet. Off-road rentals bring a danger to the surrounding community school and desert. The noise, light and ground pollution will be devastating. A much agreed a housing development would much better blend into the community in this storage compound. I hope we can raise awareness and you can bring this back and rescind your votes. Thank you ma'am. <laughs> Charles DeShazer. Mike Servillo, you're on deck. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Charles DeShazer. I'm from Topak, Arizona. I'm here to talk about uh, the April 3rd meeting, not having to do with the, the rest of them from Topak, but the fact that the county attorney at that meeting emphasized that in order to have Fourth Amendment rights, you need to be a criminal. On top of that, at the last meeting of April 17th, there was item seven, which this board forgave $46,000 of debt. And I understood it from the discussion that was held that uh, that debt included fines from the courts. I I'm not a lawyer, don't claim to be, but it doesn't seem right that, you know, this board has a right to overturn what a judge has, has put forth. And then you also on item 26 forgave over $8,700 worth of abatement assessment based on the fact that the county attorney said they made a mistake and it sat on their desk for over 15 months. The abatement took place in 2021. The property was claimed in a foreclosure in October of 2022. It went on the agenda in March of 2023. What is going on at that attorney's office that it can set for 15 months 
could have been a lot longer than that, I have no idea, and that you just, oh, our mistake, and the taxpayer is the one paying the fines on it because that abatement was done, and, you know, they, they don't seem to be uh, reviewing the things that they need to review properly because uh, later today's agenda, I'll be speaking on item, item 42, which seems very, very confusing and uh, violations of the law have occurred that I can prove. Thank you very much for your... Thank you, sir. Uh, Mike Cervello. I just want to speak briefly on the, on the broadband, uh, the five mile uh, limit. It's not going to be enough for our community. Uh, most of our people, uh, a good majority of our people, live past that almost 24 miles out. Uh, that said, I also know that there w was a grant, is a grant, that either has been um, granted and or will be soon for broadband for school children who can't afford internet service and that will be a radio link i i too work off of a radio link 22.7 miles through the air that brings me my broadband it is more reasonably priced than the starlink uh, and i don't think it's as good as starlink but it, it would do almost everything that uh, school children need to do so i'm going to stick my neck out here and speak for yucca I believe that uh, if you could put me in touch with this gentleman that gave the presentation, I would really like to see him come and speak before our community. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, we're gonna move on to the second presentation this morning presented by our public health director, Chad's, uh, Dr. Chad Kingsley, presentation on the vector control program. Dr. Kingsley, you wanna come down? Please. Yeah, it's a little chilly. Morning, Dr. Kingsley. Good morning. Let's get set up here. And good morning, uh, Chairman Lingfeller and board members. Here today to present our vector control program. Uh, I'd like to recognize Kelly Pompa from our Environmental Health Division. She's our Special Programs Coordinator, as well as Michael Cavallero from Bull Bullhead City. He's our, the Municipal entom Entomologist. So I'd like to welcome them out here today. So they have been uh, highly involved in this over the last uh, several years. So uh, just a review of our vision, our healthy people and healthy communities. To promote, to promote, protect, and improve the health of our community. One thing is uh, prevention, a lot of it is prevention, and so we, no one really ever gets credit for the mosquito bite that didn't happen. So I'd just like to be able to, be able to show the success of our program and what's been doing and, how, and what we're doing for our future of our, of our communities. So uh, for today, for just uh, this, uh, Presentation: We have the purpose of vector control program, mosquitoes in Mojave County, control methods, challenges, partnerships, and our plans for this coming season. Primarily is our surveillance, which is our first objective, really is detection of disease carrying mosquitoes. They, they, uh, many of them also uh, bite birds that do migrate and those birds carry those viruses. We're specifically looking for two uh, types of mosquitoes, a Kulik species, and they carry the West Nile virus and, uh, the, and the St. Louis encephalitis. Uh, the West Nile virus, the last case was in 2020 that we presented here, but we've also had a lot lar larger significant cases, both in Maricopa and then Clark County. So we're sandwiched in between. So any of the migrating animals or birds um, that have that are, uh, carry those viruses many times. And then we're also looking for the Sades aegypti and the Sades uh, albopictus, which can transmit Zika, dengue, and uh, uh, chikungunya viruses. Uh, we did have a dengue case first time in Arizona last year. It is uh, slowly moving up, has reached the United States, and uh, will uh, something we'll be monitoring over the next several years. Uh, 
As you can see in the pictures, uh, just like our birds, uh, mosquitoes have different markings. And so uh, we identify those mosquitoes, we're able to identify them from other types of mosquitoes, but they are rather small. Uh, this is, uh, again, so our detection is to put out traps. These traps are about 24 hours. Uh, that's how much they're collected. You can see there, that's out in Mojave Valley. Uh, these traps, they work by the little fans, as well as you put in carbon, uh, dry ice, carbon, uh, carbon dioxide. So the mosquitoes are attracted to that, get sucked in, and then we sample that. Um, due to our heat, our, uh, the dry ice does dissipate a lot quicker. So these are put out at nighttime. Try to collect all during the night, in the middle of the day, and see, uh, and see what we can get. This is Kelly in our laboratory here. Um, yes, she's taking a tweezer and each individual um, mosquito going through. Uh, when we do get larger quantities, we do weigh and do a certain percentage of it. And uh, we're able to test for the West Nile virus here in. Anything else, we send it to uh, the state for analyzation, looking for those viruses. Uh, the other one that we also, a second objective is to control is our nuisance mosquitoes, uh, which uh, is the Sarafora and the Sadies vexens. And these are very aggressive. They are out all day. Um, the most of our virus carrying vector mosquitoes are usually in the, in the morning, uh, at dawn or at dusk. <coughs> And they tend to be then, but these mosquitoes are out all day, all night. And these are the ones that really we would get complaints over. Uh, again, very aggressive and uh, somewhat of a minor plague for us here uh, in, in our county that we are uh, seeking to control. Again, this is a one day collection here, looking at this here uh, for our nuisance mosquitoes uh, collected in our traps out in Mojave Valley. Um, so our primary resources, we're going to see where we're going to find our mosquitoes at, uh, Topak Marsh and uh, marsh-like areas along the river and at our agricultural fields. So this is uh, just some pictures of where we've detected and sir, where standing water is. A lot of those, so what it depends on for mosquitoes for their ideal is usually it's clear water. Um, so it's going to depend on your crop type. Uh, when they grow uh, Bermuda grasses, though that tends to retain water and allow it to sit longer. While the mosquitoes like alfalfa, so in the alfalfa field, alfalfa field you'll find a lot of mosquitoes, while in the Bermuda you're going to find a lot of larvae. Um, but it also depends on the type of soil, so if it has any type of clay-like and it retains the water. We see pictures here and this is an ideal breeding ground for our mosquitoes. So we have a lot of our geography in our fields and also our irrigation methods. Uh, many of the irrigation methods is still, uh, we don't use drip systems, but we do flooding of the fields, which then cause uh, uh, cases like this where our mosquitoes can populate. Control methods. Um, so this is a reaction to mosquitoes. So we have two, we have foggings by trucks, uh, which they go about, they use a pyroth um, pyrothyroid insectide. Uh, that goes around uh, and the challenge is it, it the truck can go on the road. So if we have large fields, can't reach the middle of the fields. And so when we get complaints, then we contact our partners at the Fort Mojave Indian tribe and they will do spraying for us. Uh, they are very responsive, sometimes can do same day when we call and they would do the area application. Understanding that when we do this is only about one to two days has to come in direct contact with the mosquito. So we will kill an adult population, but it does nothing to the larvae and within two to two to five days we can have another again large adult population that is uh, that we need to seek to try to control so so if, as in most cases with everything primary prevention that's our best case and so larvicides so using uh, granular type of larvicides that we can apply and it can stay dry and then once it is wet it will affect the larva this will uh, help to kill off as well as be able to pr it doesn't permit the larvae from forming into adults we can apply it to the water or areas where water will soon accumulate. So uh, prevent being there, we're going to apply it and then we can walk away and be able to have that once it is uh, during rains or as well as any type of flooding irrigation. Uh, and it just helps control the mosquito population. So the challenges we have obviously is jurisdictions as well as our type of the here in Mojave Valley is that we have 
we have Bullhead City, which is a jurisdiction, Clark County, Nevada, and San Bernardino, California. And each is a jurisdiction that, you know, each has their financial challenges, but also residents or also the area that they uh, would have vector control programs. And we also have Federal, which is National Wildlife Refuge that we also have to consider. And then we have residential neighbors. We have this uh, quilt here of the area with residents within agriculture. And so it creates a lot of uh, challenges for us in being able to control these populations and prevent them. Uh, we do collaborate with all these organizations. Uh, over the last three years, I will say that Kelly and Michael have done amazing work together, working together as well as the Fort Mojave Indian tribe. Uh, this here is a picture with uh, Christine Medley and Kelly out in the fields. Christine did pass away in 2020, but she was a great partner with us and recognized uh, the Fort uh, Mojave and the agriculture there is very responsive to us and working with us. Uh, so what we did, so during, so there was a in Mojave County study, they took, um, so this area presented here, you see residents as well as agricultural fields. And so at one year they were able to identify a, where the most of the complaints were. So they went out, investigated, repeated the next year and uh, came out with results from that. So looking at this, you have three colors here. You have a gray bar, a blue bar, and a red bar. The gray bar is the mosquitoes, like in the traps you've seen. Those are the mosquitoes that are trapped out in the field. The blue ones are in the residence. And then the red one are the, uh, the amount of complaints. So around 2019, when we started getting complaints in one specific area, they started trapping there towards the end of the season, September, and you can see the number of mosquitoes they caught there in the field. And so that's usually following our monsoon seasons where there's a lot more abundance of water. So for the next year, then they, they set up traps there and monitored that year. So you can see there from May, June, it's a, a large in spike as well as in our communities and the number of complaints that went with that. So the next year, then they uh, did the prevention method and they put the granulocyte down. So comparing those two from May and also June, it more than cut it in half, as well as in our community, you can see more than took about 90% of that. So the prevention method works significantly within, those in the, within that community to be able to reduce that population of, of the mosquitoes. So uh, prevention is showing us one of our better me uh, methods instead of just responding through fogging. We still have the fogging option if that, uh, with uh, we have a, a especially wet season that we would be able to respond to that but prevention is is going to be our, our key so for our 2023 prevention again another area that we've identified from past complaints uh, so again we've already uh, put out our initial prevention method with a granular method uh, of that uh, and uh, we'll continue with the traps as well as respond to any calls uh, residential neighborhoods and fogging when needed in order to help control that if we have a large your population or complaints that is being reported. So it's gonna always gonna be kind of an ongoing process, but be able to, uh, we need to continue also monitors so that we can help control those factors that to uh, the mosquitoes that do transmit uh, any type of disease. But uh, overall, if we continue with this process, be able to really diminish the, the amount of mosquitoes, especially the nuisance, but as well as any of those that do transmit diseases. Our challenges are already gonna be our, is our monsoon months that tend to will drop water in certain places or a lot of water and uh, will then create the, an environment that we have not seen before in a certain place that we will have to discover and see where that, where that is occurring at. But overall, just really would like to commend uh, uh, Michael and Kelly here for the work they've done over the last several years to really identify and improve our community and the new systems that, uh, that plague us during um, our months uh, that we like to spend outdoors. So uh, at this time, any questions? Questions for Dr. Kingsley. That's Professor Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We have the same locations year after year that have the problems with mosquitoes. And the major problem is the flooding of the irrigation uh, fields in Mojave Valley. So basically all we do is just granulate and spray. We do nothing as far as prevention because they will do nothing to uh, change the way they uh, use their water on their, on their land. And, and it's funny because people have come up here before today, Supervisor Lingenfelter brings it up all the time about be to conserve water, and I think the worst way to irrigate is flooding, but I appreciate what the health department does because we get the mosquitoes down in Havasu. I know the 
the people in Mojave Valley, Golden Shores, even up into Bullhead, you get them too, but it's never going to stop because we don't do anything to stop it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Supervisor. Uh, any other comments for Dr. Kingsley? Dr. Kingsley, on, on top of uh, what Supervisor Johnson has shared, you mentioned in your presentation that you can pinpoint your application based on crop and soil type. Did I read mm -hmm. that right? Is that how does that factor in crop type and soil type? It, it just really, it's going to be the soil type as well as what they plant. Like I mentioned, Bermuda grass, so that retains water and they do rotate their fields. So it just depends on the crop. Male mosquitoes are the ones that go after the plants. And so the female will follow them. The blood goes, uh, they need the, the blood for their eggs. So it really depends on how they rotate. And so, and it's the roots of the plants that, that really determine the, the water retention. So um, this coming year, there are a few fields, I believe, I remember, Kelly said there's going to be less types of Bermuda grass this year, correct? Yeah, that they're planning. So they're very diligent in working with the, the agriculture communities to say, what are you planning this year? Where are you going to plant? Can we begin to target that? And the granular really is just the last few years, but uh, they're, they just commend on that side of for agriculture they're very responsive and they have done a great inroads with with our agriculture just working with them and they've built a, a lot of trust with with those members to be able to work with them and and, and, and help prevent this as best as possible so yeah. thank you for your presentation this morning and also uh, to yourself and your whole team thank yeah. you great thank you we're going to move to the consent agenda um, supervisor bishop would you like to pull any items this morning Supervisor Angus? Not this morning. Thank you. Supervisor Gould? None today, Mr. Chairman. Supervisor Johnson? No. I'd like to pull item 8 and 13. We have requests to speak forms for those. Looking for a motion to approve the consent minus items 8 and 13. Do we have a second? For that motion and second, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? I appear to have it. Do have it so ordered. Item number 8. We have two requests to speak forms on item eight. Sharon Martinez and Alex Martinez, you're on deck. Good morning. Uh, we're the property owners and we just wanted to be here to answer any questions if you have any. Okay, very good. Uh, I don't. I think I have any questions. Um, any questions for the applicants? Hearing none, I'd make a motion to approve. Second. For that motion, second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? I just appear to have it. Do have it so ordered. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, item 13, we have one request to speak for him. Chris Rodarte, I'm going to approach the podium, please. Chris Rodarty, Mojave County taxpayer. I'm in opposition to item 13. Why is Mojave County subsidizing home improvement projects? Skillfully slipped into this consent agenda item, we find over $190,000 in purchase orders for such things as HVAC units, window replacements, roofing, electrical, and flooring for selected mobile and stick-built homes under the guise of housing rehab. I can show you a few examples on the screen. Here's one for almost $40,000. It's coming up. It's probably hard to see it, but included in this is HVAC, almost 14,000 um, windows, AV 700. Here's another one. It's totaling 36,000, uh, 12,680 for HVAC on that one. And these are homes, you know, there's addresses on there where they are. These are contracts. Got another one here. For 28,000, again, home improvement projects. You know, I'm old enough, 
Uh, I gotta calm down. This is all in furtherance of HUD's dictates and rules in support of wealth redistribution on the Federal Register's website under Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing 2023, you will find race baiting language designed to further divide and segregate Americans in spite of its carefully worded wording placed to the contrary. This coming from a government founded upon liberty and justice for all. I'm old enough to remember home equity loans where you took out a second deed of trust in the form of a bank note based on the appraised value and equity in your home in order to finance improvements of your own home. You then repaid the loan in monthly installments to your lender. Well, now fortunately for some of us, that dinosaur is fast becoming extinct in favor of more government enslavement in the form of grant money stolen from its taxpaying wealth producing citizens. And once again, I can't wait to see what happens next. We have uh, Director Smith. Is Director Smith in the audience today? You come down and explain that program, please, for the folks that are watching. Chairman Linkenfelter, members of the board, community. So the home grants, which we receive, it all depends on the type of the dollar amount which somebody would apply for. Uh, depending on what they apply for would be the amount of the term in which if they live there over that term, that loan then would be forgiven. Uh, this is a loan, this, this program has been going on in Mojave County for quite some time. Uh, I, I want to say at least, and I, it's, it's my belief, it's been over 10 years uh, that we've applied to funds for this uh, and been receiving these funds for the home loan, as well as <clears throat> the revitalization, which some of those funds come from the CDBG, uh, Community Development Block Grants as well. And who are the applicants of this program? So the applicants for the program would be anyone who's, depending on the program, uh, there's, different, there's different stages of AMI, so area medium income. Area medium income would be sometimes 60, I wanna say, uh, they're, they're different supervisor. So to, to speak on exactly which level they would qualify for would be depending upon which the applicant applied for, but it would be below 80% uh, of area medium income for sure. Here, any questions for Director Smith? All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, motion to approve. Motion to approve. Do I have a second? Second. You've heard that motion and second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? I appear to have it. Do have it so ordered. Move to the public hearings. I'm going to open the public hearing on item 28. Is there anyone here in the audience wishing to speak on item number 28? Sir, if I could ask you to come to the podium and state your name and address for the record. Thank you. Michael Lindsay is my name, Beaver Dam, Arizona. I am after a, I'm hoping I'm doing the right one. Is this the right one? Number 28, open public hearing. 28, sir, yes, sir. Yeah, the rezone. It's uh, adoption of the uh, rezone, uh, Yes. BOS resolution 23078, uh, so yes. And we're seeking a, a rezone. Supervisor Johnson. Excuse me, sir, are you the applicant? Pardon? Are you the applicant? I am the applicant. I'd, I'd probably wait and see if anybody complains before I get up and talk to them. <laughs> it's your pleasure. Public hearing. Pardon? It's public hearing. So, so I'm just here for uh, approval of from a commercial to a CO where I can put uh, uh, RV storage units up to store RVs. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you, sir. You. Second call. Is there anyone that wishes to speak on item number 28? Third and final call. Is there anyone that wishes to speak on item number 38, or excuse me, 28? 
Hearing none, I'll close the public hearing. <coughs> Do I have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Approve that motion and second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? You guys appear to have it. Do have it, so ordered. I'm gonna open the public hearing on item number 29. Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to speak on item number 29? Michael Lindsay again on the applicant number 29 it will be a CO uh, designation on the property so we can put uh, covered storage for RVs. That's what the CO will let us do. So we can cover storage. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, second call, is there anyone that wishes to speak on item number 29? <laughs> Third and final call, is there anyone that wishes to speak on item number 29? Hearing none, I'll close the public hearing. Motion to approve. For that motion, do I have a second? Second. For that motion and second, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? I appear to have it, do have it, so ordered. Item number 30, I'm gonna open the public hearing on item 30. Is there anyone in the audience wishing to speak on item number 30? Second call, is there anyone wishing to speak on item number 30? Third and final call, is there anyone wishing to speak on item number 30? <laughs> Hearing none, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Oh. Entertain a motion? Make motion a motion to approve. to approve. Do I have a second? Second. For that motion and second, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? I just appear to have it, do you have it? So ordered. I'm gonna open the public hearing on item number 31. We have a few people signed up. Mr. Stanley DeShazo. Good morning. My name is Stanley DeShazo. Um, thank you all for letting us be here to speak. Mr. Uh, Mr. Larson over here. Um, submitted paperwork to y'all to uh, do a rezone. But I don't believe he submitted you a complete paperwork to that. This is what we received in the mail, those of us that live around the uh, perimeter of the property in question. Um, but it's a 40 acre parcel. And this only addresses 35 acres. So I took the liberty of correcting it a little bit to reflect a 40 acre parcel and a change to it. Um, and this does not qualify for the minor land division, which he's applying for. Um, I called and talked to some of your people. They tried to explain to me that this that this is a minimum acreage requirement. Um, the five acre and the 10 acre application for change. However, what he addresses is only the 35 acres worth of it. There's another 5.4 acres that is still remaining. So does that become a five acre parcel by default, even though he only applies for five parcels. The sixth parcel throws it into a major land division, a subdivision, which falls under different rules. Um, I don't know if you people were aware of that, but this is what we're dealing with. Not only that, he's representing a brother. They own this 40 acre parcel that he's representing this on the next section of land belongs to another brother and a wife, 40 acres there as well. The next section actually belongs to him. So 120 acres there that we believe he intends to subdivide, not just make a minor land division. <laughs> another thing in the letter that was sent to us, it states that if 20% of the residents within 300 feet, 20% of the property owners within 300 feet 
of the enclosed vicinity map, which was the first map that I showed you, um, oppose it, it will not be passed except through, this says a three quarter vote, I believe it's a four fifths vote from you all. Um, we have achieved that. We request, and Mr. Langenfelder, you said earlier, you would stand behind the residents of this county as opposed to outside interest. And we call on you to do that, sir. Thank you all. Shannon Garut. Good morning. My name is Shannon Garut, and I am a resident in close proximity and a landowner to the said parcel. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. As you all well know, <clears throat> Kingman Army Air Airfield um, was quite active here. They had the best gunnery people in the nation. Um, the gunnery range for Kingman Airfield started six miles north of Kingman and ran for 31 miles. <clears throat> that range ran between Sierra Madre and Avenida Halfley, which are the roads on both sides of the said parcel. The first target berm that was made at six miles out is three parcels down from the said parcel, also owned by the same family. Um, <clears throat> in 2010, they did soil samples in Kingman and found um, contaminants, um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon and lead. That led to a cleanup in 2013 and 2014 of 55 residential lots which were tested and found contaminated and they had to remove two feet of soil um, to make it safe. Our concern is I don't believe it's ever been tested out on the actual gunnery range where they had people shooting 50 caliber machine guns which put out a lot of bullets and this starts at this property and goes for 31 miles. I personally have found 50 caliber bullets laying out on the ground in this area because we used to have a walking path that was three miles. So I can't find anywhere where this area has actually been tested for any lead contamination and I thought the county might have some information on that and um, this is kind of an environmental issue that I think needs to be addressed before a lot of land is divided up and that lead becomes airborne. So those are our, some more of our concerns and I think that pretty much covers everything. Thank you for the, your time. I have a question for the speaker. Uh, we're still in public hearing right now. Okay. Uh, Bruce Larson. Bruce Larson. Yes. You signed up if you'd like to speak. Uh, we're basically just trying to do what everybody else was doing out there. We bought this property like in 2000 as a family. We're not a developer. Uh, or anything like that and we just wanted to split one up and uh, finally have the opportunity to do it and have what they have you know and uh, so that's really it's as simple as that we're not trying to do anything that's not norm out there and uh, the the uh, map that he showed you is not correct it actually looks like this <laughs> He had four or five acre parcels, I think. Oops, wrong way. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, there we go. And he was, there were the uh, planning and zoning uh, cleared it to be okay because this is not the surveyor's map. This is, you know, approximately where it's going to end up. And uh, so everything will, every, will meet the requirements when the sur surveyor does that. 
And uh, so, sim you know, simply that's all we're trying to do. And much like all the, all the opposition is living on minor subdivisions just like this. And so no more development out there. I, I'm, I just don't understand it. We don't have any intentions that we're not a development company, you know. We do own those, and, uh, those properties, but I'm representing my brothers because they're not good at getting up and talking to people like this, basically. So, and, and that is allowed by, by zoning to do that, uh, to be a representative, to present. So, uh, basically that's about it. Uh, and then the other, I don't, the other thing about the guns and stuff, we're never out there because we just bought the property. There's a lot of people in that area that are walking their dogs, they're riding their four-wheelers on it and stuff. And we did, uh, I don't know, it was just last year, we decided to put some do not trespass signs up just because we're worried about somebody getting hurt riding their four-wheelers and stuff like that. So we did that. So uh, we wouldn't want to do anything but bring, you know, something good to the community if we did, you know, if and when we do something. So that's the plan. So I'd appreciate your approval, planning and zoning seem fit to approve it, and uh, we would appreciate it. If, do you have any questions for me? This is a public hearing. We can't do questions until the public hearing is closed. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Second call on item number 31. Anyone in the audience wish to speak on item number 31? Ma'am, approach the podium. Please state your name for the clerk. Uh, my name is Crystal Truby I'm from Topak, Golden Shores. And I just want to, again, put this map up here that they just used to show what a vicinity proper map notification looks like to explain he was saying that this is what was included whenever they were given mailed their notification. I'm sorry. No, it's that helps. Is that not a vicinity map? I just want to, you know, let everybody be aware that whenever he they received their rezoning, that they received a notification with the vicinity map. That's what I want to state. Thank you. Yeah. Third call, is there anyone wishing to speak on item number 31? Uh, you've already had your turn? No. Um, if we need to call you back up after the public hearing is closed, then you might be able to say some more. Third and final call, item number 31. Hearing none, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Um, questions from the board members? Supervisor Bishop, did you want me to call back the uh, app? Um, yes, I'd speaker? like to uh, have Mr. DeSagio. Come back up. Seizure. Yes, ma'am. Sir, you live right next to this partial that's being considered for rezone. Um, how big is the partial that you live on? Seven acres. Seven acres? Seven acres, yes, ma'am. That's all I wanted to know, thank you. Okay, I have a question for you all since I was called back up. Parcel, the map that he showed you only speaks to 35 acres. It's a 40.14 acre parcel. That's what I was talking about earlier with the default section. There's another five acres that he does not address on his map. That's why I rewrote the map to address that, to show you that there was six parcels there, not five. Supervisor Gould. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We might want to have somebody from planning and zoning come up and explain the process. Yeah, Director Walsh. <laughs> Chairman Ling, excuse me, Chairman Lingenfelter, members of the board, good morning. Uh, staff has recommended approval to this. It was uh, also recommended by the 
Planning and Zoning Commission for approval. Um, the question regarding 10 acres and five acres and 40 acres, um, it is a 40 acre parcel. Uh, staff will work with them on the zoning requirements and, and zoning, uh, proposed zoning uh, minimums. In this case, half of the property is, is uh, proposed to be zoned 10 acre minimum. Um, the other half is proposed to be five acre minimums. And just because something has a five acre minimum doesn't mean it will be zoned all the way down to five acre minimums. Um, similar with all the properties, as was the one just, just in question, that property is zoned five acre minimums, yet they have a seven acre parcel. Um, to address the concern um, that six acre, or six parcels would be created, um, a parcel plat is required as one of the conditions of this rezone and staff will be reviewing that parcel plat for approval um, in order to move forward. So staff will ensure that there's not a six parcel created as part of this rezone. Supervisor Gould. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Walsh, uh, in regards to the requirements for a subdivision report, I believe that's by tract of land. <laughs> Is that correct? It's if you own more than five acre parcels inside a particular tract of land, you have to provide a subdivision report if you were to sell one of those parcels? Chairman Lingenfelter, Supervisor Gould, yes, once a division uh, goes more than five separate parcels or is owned, an owner owns more than five individual parcels within a tract of land, then it, it comes over to a, a subdivision report, as, as you mentioned. So. Theoretically, if the same owner owned this parcel and the parcel to the south of it, let's say, they would then, and they, they could apply for that, um, the split, but then they would own more than uh, five parcels in the same track. And were they to sell one of those, it would require a subdivision report, correct? That's a very good under question. The same, under the same ownership. And I, there may be, and that's more a question for uh, Arizona Department of, of Real Estate that-, that Good luck with asking him a question. Yeah. <laughs> I believe it, my understanding would be in, in this scenario, um, they own additional acreage adjacent to it. I don't know that it qualifies under the same tract of land where, where your a tract is more related to a subdivision. You have a subdivision tract and tract numbers that way. Um, I don't know that it would apply in this, in a minor land division. Now where they have a, additional property adjoining, um, it, it could, if they were to subdivide this one into five pieces, do the next one into five pieces and, and, and combine them or, or uh, work work in tandem or work in concert with somebody else to sell those off in smaller pieces, then, then that would uh, raise those subdivision. They might even run into that same problem if they own another parcel inside of that area. And, and that could be. That, and again, that would be something that would be through the Arizona Department of Real Estate that would enforce that. We would work with, so, so in a case like that, so, they divide these five up, they sell those five, they own additional land outside of it. Um, that would be a question that we could reach out to, to ADRE to, to find out additional. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. <coughs> Any other questions for Director Walsh? <coughs> you would like to come up again? I don't know the technicalities of it, but uh... Laura told me that if we split this through this minor subdivision, right, that we wouldn't be able to do anything with those other two lots for 10 years. That's the real estate law. So, you know, which we, did, we didn't even know that when we bought the property that we would be up against that. But uh, uh, she made it clear to me that uh, that's, that's the rule, so. Which, you know, we're fine with that. I mean, we just wanted to do this one, you know. So, thank you. Thanks. Entertain a motion. Chairman Lincoln Feltoner. Um, Bishop. 
this this property is surrounded by three 40 acre parcels that have been split down to smaller pieces just like this gentleman is wanting to do so I, I see no reason why this should not be a, approved and I will make that in the form of a motion thank you you've heard that motion do I have a second second for that motion and second any additional comments Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? I just appear to have it. Do have it. So ordered. Item number 32. I'm going to open the public hearing on item number 32. We have a number of people signed up to speak. Wayne Hollins. Wayne Holland from Golden Valley, uh, chairman and uh, supervisor. My cr number one question is, if we're going to want to impose that $5 fee for additional 1,000 gallons of water, and we're not going to accumulate $3 million for five to seven years, whatever, <clears throat> to drill a $3 million well, how much is the well going to cost to drill in five to seven years. Is that three million going to be enough or are we still going to be in the hole? If we have to drill a well, it seems to me like we spend $3 million and we know we spend $3 million today and then we pay for it. Otherwise, we're accumulating a down payment on a well that may cost more. And then it seems like we want to penalize people who don't conserve, but we don't want to help the people who want to conserve by teaching them how to do that, how to improve their land, stuff like that, to use less water. So our only incentive is to penalize people. Where's the incentive to do the right thing and do better at what we need to do? I don't, I don't understand. We always want to penalize people for, for doing this or that. Why don't we incentivize something to do them the right thing? So that, that's my main thing. I know prices go up and we need water and all that stuff, but there's plenty of water. We just got to do the right thing to get it into the ground and so we can use it. If we can't get it into the ground, use it on top of the ground. So that's my function with that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Brenda Pence. Philip Robinson, you're on deck. Hi, good morning. I know I'm not a real eloquent speaker, but I wanted to just say one thing. That it says it's to offset continuing operations and capital expense deficits. And reasonable people know that prices go up and y'all are going to have to do something. But they keep kicking the can and the little can always lands in the little guy's yard and a lot of us can't absorb it. It's a big raise from what we are paying. It's, it's almost double for a lot of us. And um, it... You know, I don't want to be accusatory. I don't think anybody's doing anything out of meanness, but it almost feels like extortion to us because we have to have water, so we have to pay, and there's nothing we can do. And that's just for your consideration. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Philip Robinson. Yes, Butch, Butch Merriweather, you're on deck. Morning, y'all. My name's Philip Robinson. I'm out at Golden Valley, unincorporated area. We always get nailed from, you, from the board, always, and nothing gets done. Right like Wayne was saying, where's the incentive? And then I'm gonna pick on this gentleman right there. I want accountability. There's no accountability coming from the director's office. Number one, on Bolsa and Igor, how many times did you guys have to redo that? that standpipe. How many times? Three. One by fan and twice by the county because an engineer didn't know what he was doing. Period. Same way on Chino. 
Where's the accountability from you all? Where's the accountability? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bush Merriweather. Thank you. I'm a little hard to hear. Sorry. Before I start my three minutes, I would appreciate if I could <clears throat> if I could keep this up so that everybody can digest it. They don't need to look at my smiling face. Most everybody knows who I am. <laughs> Good morning, Chairman Lingefelter and other Board of Supervisors. I want to thank the Supervisor for serving in the Board of Golden Valley Improvement District. However, their rulings have sometimes been flawed because of incorrect or nebulous information provided by county officials. You only base your decision on what you receive in the board backup. Uh, the subjects I'm going to be breaching today uh, cover past examples of GBD to rebut the cost increase. Both Valley Pioneer and GVID have five wells each. Valley Pioneer are currently only using four of their five. The county officials say they only are using two. According to county officials, two of the five wells are non-viable. There's no further explanation what that means. And the newest well has a cracked casing and the county currently is in litigation with the person who installed it. <coughs> My question regarding the newest well is, did the county receive an implied or written warranty when they entered into the contract with a well dwelling company? Uh, and has the county sought local well drillers company to see if they would be interested in pulling the well casing and repairing it? And it can you can continue on with your uh, litigation. The biggest FUBA in regard to GVID was when Zelda Wright, then the manager of GVID, sent out a letter to the hundreds of people who own property inside the boundaries. She said in her letter that 51% of the people agreed to wit water would be brought to the property for $4,800 per partial. Needless to say, more than 51% of the people jumped on that idea and agreed. The board agreed to a, on the expansion and it was full steam ahead. Part of it was an engineer study to be paid by the residents. However, as soon as the 51% was achieved, Ms. Wright sent out another letter saying, oops, we made a mistake. It's now gonna be $18,000 per partial. The reason for the second letter was because the information for the original letter was based on 10 year old data that was out of date. The residents were up in arms about the change of pricing, so they granted more than 51% to stop the expansion. The problem was the residents were still on the hook for the cost of engineer study. My personal cost was $780 that I paid for the engineer study that's on a shelf and probably is going to be outdated by the time it's going to be used. The latest example of poor decision was the flow point system. The county paid $1,000 for it installed at the three sandpipe. It was for the purpose that people could use credit cards. Now, as of today, whoops, I'm sorry. You can finish your sentence, go ahead. Pardon? You can finish your sentence, go ahead. I, you can finish your sentence, go oh, ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, now, as of today, the county has said you can't use credit cards anymore. So why did they waste that money? We had a system before with blue cards that was issued uh, and they put it in the system. The only other thing I can say is um, I understand that Valley Pioneer is a private company governed by the state of Arizona and GVD is not. Um, so how can Valley Pioneer operate at less cost with more employees than what GVID? I don't have the answer. And I would appreciate if maybe you would table your decision until you get the correct information. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Next speaker is Sarah representing Golden Valley Water. I don't have a last name. Here we go. Okay, I'll try this again. My name is Sarah Carter. I am representing 
uh, Golden Valley Water, which is a business that I operate. I'm also a resident of Golden Valley Water. A couple of things that I want to touch on is the uh, $5 surcharge for the 1,000 gallon. I want to know where the commercial water haulers are going to stand on that because we, of course, pull a lot of water doing our business, supplying uh, water to our customers that rely on us for our service. So this would greatly increase our cost that, of course, would have to be passed down to our customers. So um, I would like to have a better understanding of where we're going to stand with that. The second is also with the rate increase, again, talking about because we pull so much water. Um, I want to know... I want to know if the commercial water haulers are still going to be subject to pay the exact same rate as everyone else, or would the commercial water haulers have a break with the water rate as compared to what the residential water haulers pay? The third here, uh, I'm not sure if there's a current tier system already in place. However, um, one of the proposals, it looks like that there is going to be a tier system uh, coming into place. Again, us commercial water haulers providing a service out to the residents of Golden Valley, we're going to be pulling the most water on a single account with us uh, commercial water haulers. So even though as our businesses pull so much water coming off of one account, we are dispersing the water at numerous uh, addresses. <coughs> that pretty much covers everything. Um, however, the other item that I wanted to speak about, I don't, is that gonna happen later today? Is it not related to this item? It's not related to this item? It is not uh, in any of these uh, issues. I have brought it up before with uh, Public Water Works, and they said this is something that is going to have to be brought to the boards of uh, members, board members of supervisors. Uh, do me a favor and hand that whatever it is to the clerk, and we'll make sure it gets distributed to everybody, okay? And say that a little uh, bit louder for me, please. Would you hand that to the clerk and we'll make sure it gets distributed to everybody, okay? Okay, perfect. Mark Schmidt, Schmidtke? I'm not ready to give this to you just yet. Hello, my name is Mark Schmidtke. I live in Golden Valley, Arizona. Uh, I just basically wanted to state that I strongly oppose the current uh, uh, rate increase structure that you have in place now. It's not equitable. Uh, it was brought to my attention by my wife that in 2021, uh, Jennifer Esposito uh, addressed this board back then, and uh, your board stated that uh, ARPA funds would take care of any new well uh, additions. Uh, as far as I understood, in 2021 and 2022, uh, the ARPA was going to fund any new well. Now in 2023, I haven't heard a word about it. So uh, I don't know where the money's coming from, but I don't think uh, the $5 per thousand gallon uh, rate is uh, quite equitable. And as far as, I, I've always been a customer that goes out of my way to try to conserve water. And now I find out I'm gonna be penalized for it. Uh, it just doesn't seem to make sense. If you're gonna do it, at least make it the same rate increase across the board. Don't penalize somebody for trying to conserve water. That's all I gotta say. Thank you, sir. Jennifer Esposito. Dave Johnson, you're on deck.
Jennifer Esposito, as was just pointed out on August 16th, 2021, I came before this board as the only person looking out for the rate payers of the GVID because I have skin in the game. As I said, I, I have property there and we also have another property that we hold the tax lien on. We have uh, horses out there and we have that nice lady come and fill our water. At the time, my rate had gone up $5, which was not her fault. That had to do with the rising costs of gas and what we like to call Bidenflation. Now at that meeting, I asked what happens when this uh, project that the COVID money was going to go for goes over budget because every single thing this county does goes over budget, at least as long as I've been watching. And my husband who's been here over four decades said the same thing. And, I, and it's on the video and I was told specifically if the project, the well, the new well that we've already started on, if it goes over budget, then Gene could use next year's ARPA money to make up the difference. Now, the well that that I was told had already been started on, uh, I, it was stated that the money for that was in the 2022 fiscal year budget. It had already been approved in the budget. So using ARPA money basically just freed up budget money. This was um, well over $700,000, I believe, and some weird number down to the penny. Uh, and so uh, I said, you know, I want to know if we have further issues with this, how these people, my neighbors, are going to pay their water bill or how I'm going to get stuck paying my water bill for, for my livestock. And it, you know, the gist of the whole conversation, and I urge you before you take any action on this to go back and review that video, was that the rate payers would not be subject to this. Now, this, there's another issue with GVID that I brought before this board several years ago, and that was having the stakeholders take back over the board because there is no oversight, there is no accountability. And I recommended at the time, if you could not or would not give the board back to those of us who have to be subject to this, then I suggested that you appoint an advisory board, just like planning and zoning reviews the items and makes recommendations so that at least we, the stakeholders, would be able to review these things, review the budget, review the use of equipment being loaned out to other projects and other issues that Kathleen Mischler and I brought up years ago, but you guys didn't do it. It's just another one of those things that we said, hey, you need an advisory board or you need to give it back to us because you're doing a terrible job. None of you have property in that district, so it doesn't really matter to you, but it matters very much to us because water in the desert is the most precious resource you can have. And so before you make a decision, I urge you to go back and look at the finances that were stated in that meeting because it looks to me like you're trying to pull a fast one on us. Thank you. Dave Johnson. Good morning, all. Um, I'm just finding out about this increase from Golden in the GVID, so I'm a little bit late to the party here. Uh, and I want to thank my supervisor, Jean Bishop, for the diligence that she put through to make sure that all her constituents in Golden Valley were kept abreast of this information. Anyhow, when it comes to this rate increase, the surcharge, by my low estimation for Balsa Road, there's about five water haulers a day that make five trips a day, and each one of them carry about 2,000 gallons every time they load up. So that's about 10,000 gallons per hauler, or $50 in surcharge per hauler, times five haulers, that's $250 a day, times 20 days, that's $5,000 a month. Then there's about the 30 homeowners that get their 500 gallons, and that comes up to about $1,500 per month in surcharge. And then let's just estimate that there's 2,000 homeowner accounts that are getting water directly that are attached to that well. That comes up to another $20,000 a month. So that's $26,000, $500 just through the Bolsa Road. Now, if you throw those same numbers to the um, other station there on Chino and Laguna, that's $53,000 a month that's in surcharges. How long, how much money are we trying to raise here with the surcharges? 
how long is this surcharge going to go on for is my question. And I guess through this gentleman here, it's around $3 million that you're trying to raise. As for the water haulers, ma'am, I'm sorry for you all, but us homeowners, our time at that water station is just as important as you water haulers. So whether we use one side or the other, you're just gonna have to wait your turn like us. Thank you. All right, um, yeah. second call. Anyone that didn't sign a request to speak for him, does anyone wish to speak on item number 32? Third, third and final call under the public hearing. Anyone wish to speak on item number 32? Sir? Please state your name for the clerk. My name is Gary Goolsby. I live in, excuse me, I live in Golden Valley. Uh, in the 1990s, I moved to Golden Valley. And at that time, we had assessments on our property to finance the standpipe, the tanks, whatever. So my point is, rather than let's see, rather than tax the people who are using the water now, why are we not spreading this bill to all landowners? to all the people that live out of state that own this land. They're gonna benefit from these improvements as much as we are. So it's my opinion that all landowners should pay for these improvements. That's all I have to say. Again, third call under the public hearing. Anybody wish to speak? Uh, you've had your turn, Mr. Hollins. Thank you. You've had your turn, I think, Mr. Hollins, didn't you? Uh, we'll call you back if we have to after the close. Thanks. I'm going to close the public hearing on item number 32. Questions or comments from the board? What's the pleasure of the board? Mr. Lingenfelter, before we uh, accept a, a motion, uh, maybe Steve Lukowski or someone from GVID can, can speak and... Sure, Director Latoski, you wanna come up? <laughs> Good morning, uh, Chairman Lingenfelter, members of the board. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, staff uh, comes before the board uh, with a uh, proposal and uh, recommendation on two distinct measures. One is a increase in the uh, water rates uh, for the Golden Valley Improvement uh, water system, primarily driven uh, by the uh, <clears throat> capital uh, expenses as it relates to repair and replacement of certain system uh, components and appurtenances in recent years, as well as addressing the inflationary impacts that have duly affected uh, the Golden Valley Improvement District. Our intent is to continue to operate the system uh, to the best practices of the industry. And the second component of our proposal, distinctly separate, is a surcharge being proposed uh, to develop a reserve fund to construct a new third well, adding to system capacity and redundancy. Before I go any further, I would like the board to uh, know that uh, I do have our engineering manager, Mike Garman. He's a registered civil engineer and subject matter expert in water resources. Mr. Garman has a brief presentation that can outline the problem statement and the proposal uh, for the board uh, should they desire for some specific clarity in terms of the actual proposal elements. It'll be a brief proposal, uh, brief presentation. Yeah, would you? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Board of Supervisors. I'm Mike Garman, the Engineering Manager for the Golden Valley Improvement District Number One. 
On April 3rd, the board approved a public hearing to consider a proposed water rate increase for the district. I'm here to explain why the rate, is need, rate increase is needed. The district area is in the western half of Golden Valley, about 13 miles from Kingman. It includes all customers west of Teddy Roosevelt, south of Chinley, and north of Shinnerump. The district was established by the board in 1990. It is self-funded, which means we don't get any revenue from the county's general fund. <coughs> we have about 1,600 meter customers and 350 standpipe customers. Our existing water rates were established by the board in 2017. All metered customers pay a $15 base charge, even if they don't use any water. Uh, but with that $15 charge, they get 1,500 gallons per month at no extra charge. For metered usage above 1,500 gallons per month, customers pay $6.56 per 1,000 gallons. Uh, district standpipe rates are currently $5.96 per 1,000 gallons. Out of district standpipe customers currently pay $9.84 per 1,000 gallons. As I mentioned, we are self-funded, so we have to cover all of our costs with the revenue we generate from our customers. This graph shows that our operation and maintenance costs have escalated over time, so they now exceed our revenues. Since 2018, our operation and maintenance costs have increased at an average annual rate of 10.9%, while district revenues have increased at an average annual rate of 7.8%. The, the main in reason for the increase is, is mainly due to repairs. This slide compares our FY 2018 total operation maintenance costs with those of FY 22. Our FY 2018 operation maintenance costs were about $281,000, uh, 41% of that being salaries and benefits, 15% being electricity, and 44% being what I'm going to call other O&M. Other O&M uh, includes repairs, maintenance, supplies, fuel, insurance, and everything else we have to pay for to do business. These costs have risen significantly since 2018, with total operation maintenance costs being more than doubled by fiscal year 2022. As you can see from the chart, most of the increase has happened in the other O&M category, with being more than half of our total operation maintenance costs. Like I said before, this is mostly due to costly repairs. We recently had a water line fail on Hershey Way that we are in the process of repairing. That will cost the district about $100,000 to fix by the time we finish restoring the pavement. The system is aging, and as you know, most things get more expensive to take, take care of as they get older. One way to look at this is to consider the district's depreciation expenses. This slide shows the original value of the district assets, including our buildings, wells, and infra other infrastructure. Also shown are accumulated depreciation and the net value of the assets. As you can see, our assets have depreciated in value by 65%. Depreciation costs the district money in the form of increased wear and tear, and higher maintenance costs. Um, our, uh, oops, went ahead. Our annual depreciation costs on our net, on our assets are about $250,000 per year. This is the additional amount of revenue we targeted for our proposed rate increase. I'd like to switch gears for a minute and discuss excessive water use by some of our customers. Everyone here is aware that we live in the desert and that water is a scarce resource. It has been the policy of the district since 1990 that one service connection equals 200 gallons per day, or about 6,067 gallons per month. It has also been district policy that customers can purchase additional water allocations if they want to use more than 200 gallons per day. The table on this slide shows that in July of 2022, more than 30% of our customers used more than 6,100 gallons per month. Some customers use significantly more than that. Now, we're talking about metered customers. We're not talking about standpipe customers. Uh, some of the high users are commercial operations and other are residential users that irrigate their landscape during the summer. It is the position, it is the position of the district staff that these high use customers cost the district more money than other customers in terms of increased production costs and increased wear and tear on our infrastructure. And they do so without paying more for access to the water. 
Our proposed new rate schedule will address this if adopted. So what are we proposing for new rates? First, the base charge of $15 will stay the same, but we will discontinue the 1,500 gallons per month allowance. We looked, at six, we looked at six other nearby water utilities and most of them do not have such an allowance. It's estimated that this change alone will generate an additional revenue, uh, additional revenue of a little over $145,000 per year. Next, metered usage will go up to $7 per 1,000 gallons, meaning all metered customers will pay an additional 44 cents per 1,000 gallons for the first 6,099 gallons used. For customers using more than their 6,099 gallons per month allotment, they will pay a second tier conservation rate that promotes conservation for, of $10 per 1,000 gallons for the additional water. If they own enough water allocations for their use, they will be charged the standard rate of $7. Sorry. Uh, standpipe rates will go up slightly. In district standpipe customers will see a four cent increase to six dollars per 1,000 gallons. Out of district standpipe customers will see a 16 cent increase to ten dollars per 1,000 gallons. What does this mean in terms of customer bills? This slide shows metered customer bill impacts for various amounts of water usage. We have a small percentage of customers that have an account that don't use any water. Their bills will stay the same. Other customers seeing the, the, the customers seeing the largest percentage increase in their overall water bill will be those that use 1,500 gallons per month. If you're one of those customers, your new, your new bill would be just under $27, whereas before it was a little over $15. This has to do with that uh, elimination of that 1,500 gallon per month allowance. This is about 17% of our customers. Everyone else will see a smaller percentage impact of their bills, around 50% increase or less. Okay, now that I've discussed what we need to cover our annual operation and maintenance costs, I'd like to switch gears again and talk about the district's need for a new well. Our water demands are met by two wells, wells one and two. Well two currently cannot pump to our high tanks on Teddy Roosevelt. That means for 1,300 of our customers, there's only one well to keep them in service with no backup. This was made perfectly clear when the motor on well one failed in May of 2021, and the district made news headlines because we had to issue a boil water notice. We have since then purchased a spare motor, but that particular service emergency cost the district about $200,000. Also, there are many other things that can go wrong with well number one that cannot be fixed with spare parts. Some of those problems will be catastrophic for district customers, leaving them without water service for an extended period of time. The estimated cost for a new well that would give us the firm capacity we need is about $3 million. One way to raise those funds is to add a surcharge to customer bills on top of what we need for our operational expenses. How big of a surcharge should be recommended depends on a variety of factors, including the customer's tolerance for paying more for their water and how long we want to take to collect enough money to do our well project. <coughs> the district staff settled on an additional $5 per 1,000 gallons for all, all customers, including standpipe customers. Based on past usage, it's estimated we would take a little less than seven years to save up $3 million at this rate. After the well project is done and everything is paid for, the board could, could, could consider discontinuing the surcharge. This slide shows the metered customer bill impacts for various amounts of water usage if the new well surcharge of $5 per 1,000 gallons is added to the proposed rate increase. The table shows that nearly all metered customer bills would more than double. If you're in that 17% that's currently using 15 gallons, 15, 1,500 gallons per month, your new bill would be just under $35 as opposed to the 1584 you're currently paying. Another 45% of our customers fall within 1,500 gallons to 6,100 gallons per month. These customers would pay somewhere between $47 and $93 per month, depending on how much water they use. 
The remaining 30 or so percent who use more than 6,100 gallons per month would see bills in excess of $100 per month. In conclusion, I'd like to do a quick recap of this presentation. District staff determined that we should target an additional $250,000 per year to meet our increasing operational costs and set aside cash reserves for repairs. The proposed rate increase would eliminate the 1,500 gallon monthly allowance, raise metered rates by 44 cents per 1,000 gallons, and add a second tier conservation metered rate for high use customers. There would also be small increases in stamp pipe rates. Aside from meeting our operational expenses, another goal for the district is to save $3 is to save up $3 million for a new well. To raise this money, we propose an additional surcharge of $5 per 1,000 gallons on top of the recommended rate increases. Thank you for your time. That concludes my presentation. Thank you, Mike. Questions for Public Works or for Mike? It's President Bishop. Mike, uh, did we do a comparison with other uh, water companies in the area, like, uh, like, uh, I forgot the name, but yeah, we we did a comparison with a few other. Uh, I think there were six different utilities that we looked at. Um, one thing we did notice is there was only uh, one other utility that offered. Um, uh, monthly allowance, and they actually charge way more for their base rate than we did. Um, our rates that we have right now are pretty much in line with what everybody else has. Um, so, it, uh, yeah, we, we looked at some other, other companies. Okay, so um, Valley Pioneer, how do we compare with, with what they're charging if we go with the increased rate? Our, our, our um, water rates would be higher. They would. A lot. Okay, I am hearing that they are also considering a pay it, or a rate increase. Is there any validity to that? Um, I really wouldn't know. I, I can't speak for Valley Pioneer. Uh, I do know that one thing to consider is that they have a much larger customer base than we do. And so they take in a lot more revenue than we do. Um, typically, water utilities can realize economies of scale whenever you have a larger customer base. Uh, you don't have to, sp you can spread the cost across a lot more people. Uh, I, th I think they've got like more than double the customer base that we do or something like that. Okay, well, it really concerns me seeing the, the graph that you put forward showing the revenue and the expense. I mean, they're... It's not balanced at all with the way we're doing it now. So I, I definitely uh, uh, don't see us given an allowance. I, I'm glad to see that that is going away. But um, with with the unforeseen repairs, like on Hershey Way, and then the the well problem with with the new well that we were attempting to drill, um, it's cost a lot of money. And my concern is that we keep water in the standpipes and in, in the homes that are within this district. So um, I don't like the idea of this huge increase, but I don't like the idea of the people turning on their faucet and having it go dry either. So um, I don't know, it's, we're kind of at a quandary. We're, we don't have the money to support what we're trying to do now. So Steve, did you have something you wanted to add? Uh, supervisor, uh, Chairman Lingenfelter, Supervisor uh, Bishop, uh, the uh, comparison of six different water systems is in the uh, staff backup. And just to recap, uh, I'll just pick up four in the immediate vicinity Valley Pioneer. Their minimum charge, minimum, is $21.82. Uh, Walnut Creek, a minimum charge, $19.75. This is just the minimum charge, and there's still a, a rate uh, associated with that. So high is $27.25 minimum, and chloride is $41 minimum. Chloride does include 2,000 gallons per minute. They're the only other water system that includes uh, a two, uh, an allowance, which is 2,000 uh, gallons per month. Okay. Thank you, Steve. That that helps quite a bit with, with that comparison. And I know with, with the drought that uh, 
it doesn't seem like it's going to be letting up. I, I think a lot of water districts throughout the state are going to be seeing um, meetings just like this where the customers are upset, but the rates are going up and uh, water is going to be more valuable than gold, unfortunately. So um, that's all the questions I have. Thank you. Supervisor Gould. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Latoski. Um, if you're going to charge the existing customers for infrastructure, will you then raise the connection price to the new customers since the existing customers are going to be paying for the infrastructure? Uh, Chairman Lingenfelter, Supervisor Gould, um, there is another element of this proposal, and that is to uh, uh, increase uh, administrative fee charges for uh, new customers uh, coming on board, um, most notably the uh, meter and connection fee from $1,000 to uh, $1,500. Uh, we still hold the uh, uh, future, uh, the water allocations that uh, the district still holds. I believe it's just a little north of 400 total unassigned water allocations, so uh, any sales of them which really are more prescribed for increased capacity for the system in the future, they would go into the district's future development fund for use in uh, increasing the capacity of the system. Okay. Do we have the authority to levy a tax on all of the property owners? One of the speakers mentioned that. Do we have that authority? Uh, yes. Uh, Chairman Lingenfelter, Supervisor Gould, uh, uh, this does get into more of the Arizona State statutes in uh, Title 48. Uh, one means by which all of the property owners could bear the cost of a new well would be through a petition to incur expense under the auspices of the district itself. Otherwise, the district uh, uh, board, uh, you all, uh, would have that opportunity to levy, uh, I believe, an ad valorem tax. Uh, generally, that's considered when there's a, a shortfall, kind of an emergency shortfall in operations and maintenance where uh, the board may consider an ad valorem tax. It could possibly be considered in this case too for a new well construction. Did we do any study on what that tax would be per parcel? This is Reservoir Gould, we did not, no. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Other questions for Director Lutowski? Director, I have a couple questions for, um, you know, I, I don't doubt the, the need, Mike spelled it out pretty succinctly, um, but I am concerned with having the meter, metered customers bills going up so so much, um, especially today when we see inflation hitting every area of people's lives. I mean, it couldn't come at a worse time. Um, <clears throat> have you thought of any other ways to, to, to um, finance this or to make the burden as least as possible? And, and the thing that immediately comes to my mind is, um, has the district looked into WIFA loans or some of the one-time funding for um, water augmentation. Uh, I know that there's some grant programs that are coming down. I mean, why not have the district apply for a grant for $3 million um, to, to pay for this, to cover the cost of this well? Um, um, but it, uh, that and, and, you know, some of WIFA's regular programs as well. I mean, they have a drinking water fund. They have other, these other funds. Um, has, has the district explored um, any of those avenues? Uh, Chairman Lingenfelter, that's a very good question. Uh, the district, uh, amongst our obligations in operating uh, four other water systems, uh, we have become very familiar with uh, some other revenue options. With regard to WIFA loans, uh, that would still demand a repayment, uh, so we would still need a sustained revenue source in order to satisfy our future obligations, our debt obligations. Um, as far as uh, grants, uh, we uh, are unaware of any pertinent grants to Golden Valley uh, Improvement District right now. Uh, the Arizona Commerce Authority had been successfully used uh, uh, for a new well construction in the I-40 Industrial Park, but ACA grants are steered towards economic development. We don't have that element uh, in Golden Valley, at least at present. Uh, so uh, we have looked at all types of alternatives with regard to uh, grant money. Well, I know that WIFA has uh, 200 million set aside for water conservation, uh, different categories there. I know Tim Walsh and, and Sam have been going to webinars for those programs, but I know that there's another 200 or 250 million dollars set aside for um, water supply development fund. I mean, there's there's two 
three pools all together, one that the, the billion dollar one for water augmentation, bringing new water from outside the state into the state. Then there was water conservation. Then there's the other pool of, of funds. Um, would this project be an applicant for a, either a grant or a loan under one of those types of a program? Um, and I mean, as far as financing it, maybe this board, uh, if we have the ability to do that, creates a funding source, a dedicated revenue source um, as a part of the, the, the taxing structure. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I'm just thinking out loud, but I mean, it's, it's, I really don't think that it could come at a worse time having the, the rates go up so much. It's just my opinion. It's the pleasure of the board. I will I will make the recommendation or I'll make the motion that we uh, approve the recommended motion. What? For that motion, do I have a second? Say no. I have a motion to discuss. <laughs> yes. Go ahead. Um Ms. Rangus. <clears throat> so Supervisor Lingenfelter brought up an idea. Is that worthy of at least discussion before we may took action on this with maybe some other ideas of how it could be funded? It's your district, so I, I defer to you. Um, you know, I would love to say there's a grant out there that's gonna dig us out of this hole that this district is in right now, but I think if we were able to get a grant, then we could come back and revisit the rates. And I think we should continue to look for, look for grants, but uh, you just heard the director say that, you know, there are no grants out there now that he's aware of. So, you know, do we put it off and then uh, bring it back in a month or six months? It, it's, uh, we're not meeting our expenses, so we have to do something. Or if Golden Valley wants to take the district over again like they did a few years ago, I'm not opposed to that either. Just some oversight would be better. Manager Elters, did you want to make a comment? Mr. Chairman, uh, board members, as of last week, uh, a webinar was provided to provide to uh, walk potential applicants through the process. Uh, the WFA, the Water Infrastructure Finance agency is really in the early stages there uh, th there are still more questions than answers uh, and then there's obviously the um, degree of confidence or the reliability of when you apply if you get funding and what you will get in the way of funding given what the board just received from staff as far as the reality is concerned, which which is f expenses do uh, exceed the revenues, it may be uh, prudent to act on the recommendation. Uh, we can always revisit those in the near future if the uh, if the uh, district, if the GVID uh, finances um, improve and look better. But the reality is um, we strive to provide a reliable water system to the residents within GVID and not having the finances to upkeep with the repair and the replacements of parts necessary uh, truly uh, places the district in a, in a more dire uh, situation that um, we would be recommending. I hope I answered your question, but I'll be happy to answer any additional question you may have. I'll def defer to the, the county supervisor whose district this is, but just looking at what was approved yes or last year, um, gosh, where is it? It, it looks like, Forty-seven billion dollar million, excuse me, forty-seven million dollars was put towards the water supply development fund. Um, so maybe in the meantime, we could look into it. 
as a potential option for the district. I think we have a motion on the floor. So yes, I'll, I'll stay with my motion, but I, I just wanted to remind people when we ran out of water, when that when the well went down, the um, the amount of outcry from people that needed water for not only their households but their animals and their uh, you know their livestock, their dogs, uh, it was it was a it was a sad time for Golden Valley, and it lasted for for quite a long period of time. We took water out, we, bottled water we gave for uh, anybody that w wanted to come to the fire department and pick it up. It was, uh, it was something that I would hate to see Golden Valley go through again. So if we have to uh, raise the rates a little bit to keep water in Golden Valley in this district, um, I, I don't want to raise your water rates any more than you want to pay them, but we want to keep water out there. If we find a grant, which we will continue to search for grants, um, we can bring this back and lower the rates. But I think for right now, my motion does stand. You've heard that motion. Do I have a second? Second. You've heard that motion and second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? I just appear to have it. I do have it. So ordered. I'm going to move to the regular. In other words, sorry, a break. What you guys just did. So, excuse me. We're going to. I've had a request to take a two-minute break, so we'll come back in. We'll, we'll adjourn at uh, re, reconvene in, in uh, 1235.
Going to reconvene. We're going to get started. We're going to move to item number 37 as well. Another fun one. Is that mine, I hope? No, it's mine. Oh, it's full oh, thing. Yeah. Um, we've got a number of people that are signed up to speak for item number 37. We're going to go through these. First up is Mike Savillo. Cervello? Cervello. Cervello, excuse me. Just for the record, Cervello, Cervello, same name, one is Spanish, one is Italian. Thank you. So it's all good. Uh, I would like to change my speaking slot with Rob. Hooper, so he can set, so he can set the tone, if I may. Would that be okay with the board? Yeah, it's fine by me. Is that a yes? Mr. Robert, Rob Hooper, please. Mike Sverio, you're on deck. I could say good morning, but I think it's good afternoon now, right? Uh, it's good to be here with you. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. For the record, it's uh, Robert Hooper. I uh, live out on Santa Fe Ranch. And I'm here today to talk about County Road 15, County Highway 15, also known as Alamo. Um, first of all, I want to I say thank you uh, to the board here uh, for having made the decision to put this on the books uh, prior to this. And I want to thank uh, county staff for all the help that we get out of your staff, uh, Manager Elders. Uh, we've gotten a lot of help here recently from folks coming out and helping us look at how to maintain our roads better. And we greatly appreciate of uh, what the county does. And I want to, again, come back and say thank you for deciding to put this project on the books uh, when you first put it on there. Uh, it's a really important project. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, County Highway 15 has in, experienced a huge uh, growth in traffic. Um, as we've gone through the years, uh, commercial traffic, uh, the water haulers, uh, FedEx, UPS, uh, mining now that's happening out in that part of the world, uh, a lot of the workers that are going up and down. Um, and then also the fact that we, if you, if you look on your Google Maps and you're coming across 40 and you're going to Phoenix, it tells you to go that way because it's 100 miles shorter than coming through Kingman and down. And we're getting a lot of traffic, and I won't bore you with all the stuff that you already know. That's why you made the decision in the first place. Lake traffic, um, but also might say that with our residents out on, uh, on the ranch, a lot of folks, uh, we have doctors and nurses, and uh, my, my wife's a caregiver. She travels that road every morning and every evening. Um, and this one section that we're talking about right now, this phase two, is a really tough section. It would have been nice if we'd done that first, but that wasn't practicable. Um, but that section is the worst section of the road. Um, and I know that's one of the reasons that the budget's been driven up. There's, I think, 27 water, low water crossings on that section. And I actually went through and counted them a couple times. And it depends on how you count them. It could be as much as 30. Um, but th that's where I've seen cars flipped. I've seen cars with broken axles. Uh, just It goes on and on. And there's so many residents will tell you that their cars have been beat up and destroyed by that road, but particularly that section. So it's really important to get that done. Um, as president of the uh, Property Owners Association Board, I can tell you that our members are very, very concerned about this. They really like to see this get, get fixed and get it fixed this year. Of the three options you have, the one that I would love to see you make a decision on is to go ahead with the project that you've already approved. Um, uh, find the reserve, find some way to get that done. Uh, our residents really need it. It's a safety issue. I can't tell you how many times I've stopped on that road to help moms that are taking their, their kids to school and things like that. So thank you very much. Sir. Mike Cervello. As those of you who have been kind enough to tolerate me in the past up here, I appreciate it. Um, as you know, my thing is infrastructure. I believe that the Yucca area is going to end up being the next big city. If you look at Havasu and Bullhead and Mojave Valley and Kingman, those places have grown so much that it's difficult. You go to a stoplight in Havasu and you may be at that stoplight for three different lights. 
The infrastructure was not thought about clearly in for the future, and they all have traffic problems, and they all have problems because of that. So I think that this, this small infrastructure project needs to be done that allows this community to grow. Right now uh, on I-40, there are three warehouses going up. I believe there are warehouses that look like warehouses to me going up. All of those people can't live in Kingman, and all of those people can't live in, in Havasu. And our area is the place where those regular day-to-day -day jobs, those people can afford to live. So what I'd really like to see is that we find a way to make this project go ahead, that we find maybe even use contingency funds if necessary and or divide up the project. But the last thing I want, I, the last thing I don't want to see is that this project gets set to the side at all. We were promised it in 1991. It's been two, two and a half years since we were promised it again. And I think that our community deserves this. I think our community, it will have the growth to, to make it possible to, to use and maintain these roads the way we are. And from the safety and ingress, egress point, those are all set up within Santa Fe Ranch and, and the surrounding areas. So this would make a huge difference in the way it's done. And if you could, at a minimum, keep us on the five-year plan and at maximum, get us some contingency funds to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lord Warren Pierce DeVille. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the board and everybody else. And thank you very much for getting my name right this time. Um, yeah, living out there where we do, we actually end up spending a lot of money on gas tax because a lot of money, a lot of people work in Kingman or Havasu. It's a hundred mile round trip on average. I live right in the middle of the development. It's one hundred and one tenth of a mile to come here. You've got the new uh, RV park going in at Yucca. If Alamo is paved, you're going to get a lot of RVs going up and down there, which we don't particularly want, but if it gets us Alamo, we'll suck it up. Now, as a mechanic, I can attest to the fact that I repair a lot of vehicles off ammo, broken struts and everything. This is, eventually this is going to result in a really bad accident. I mean, I'm swamped in work, which is another reason I want the thing done, so I can slow down a little bit. But the main thing you've got to look at, the contingency fund, I believe, is still a perf fund. So this is all coming from gas tax. But spending this money will encourage growth. Now, you've had what, over a quarter of a century of income from property tax out there. And if you spend this money, it should encourage more people to build more houses because it's easier to get to them. Now, I know from our property tax that it won't take too long until you get this money back. So the more money you put in, the more you'll get back. And that's why I happen to think pulling the funding from the uh, Butch Cassidy paving was a, a big mistake because that would really encourage growth. Growth. But basically, I just want to say, we pay a lot of money out there in property taxes. I know that doesn't fund this, but we also pay a lot in gas taxes. And the more people you get going out there, the more income you'll receive. But you're spending gas taxes when the in when you get the income tax ta when you get the income back. This will be money that goes in the general fund that can be used for everything. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Scott Moore. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, I'd also like to remind you, as they've said before, uh, Alamo Road is a main artery from this area to Phoenix. And if there was emergency services needed to move to, to either our area or to Phoenix, uh, Alamo Road would be a very important artery. And eventually, it's going to need to be improved. And uh, the, the project had been approved, and then the funding had been taken away. But we, for the future, uh, it, it really should be. Uh, 
finding a way to fund that project because it, it, it's gonna be important. As Yucca starts to improve, if we desire quality improvements in, in Yucca, the workforce is gonna need to be more local. It's gonna be prohibitive to drive from Havasu or from Kingman, make that 100 mile round trip a day. We're gonna need people in the area. And uh, an improved Alamo Road will uh, make the area a, a, a lot better place to be. And that's all I wanted to say then, thank you. Thank you, sir. Doug France. Carol Wilk, you'll be on deck. Chairman and supervisors, thank you for this time. Um, I'm with uh, the rest who feel that the project should move forward. And it is the worst section of County Highway 15, uh, Yucca Road. And we've talked about cars breaking down on it and things like that. I don't know if any of you guys have heard about normalized deviance. That means in a safety realm, you become blind to something, that you roll a stop sign every day and nothing happens. So now it becomes safe in your mind. Normalized deviance, the, uh, the talk on it came out about the space shuttle. When they started launching the space shuttle, they had zero degradation on the O-rings of the, of the rocket that shoots the Challenger off. And they got the first one down and it was degraded to 30%. And they said, well, okay, we'll try it again. Well, the next one was degraded down 40% and it still didn't blow up. So that instead of taking a standard for a county highway and bringing this section up to what would be an acceptable standard, don't lower our standard and say it's acceptable because you know what? They did it for 12 times and then the Challenger blew up because they lowered their standards of safety. That section of road, like he says, has 25 to 30 different water crossings, goes up and down. And when you have an accident in there, it is no longer called an accident. It's called a predictable surprise. It will happen, something will happen. Now you've just approved 200 and some white what do you want to call them? Barn dominiums on the start of Highway 15. They are going to Google how to get back home and none of them read maps anymore and they're all going to head down that road with motor homes, whatever it may be. We even see truckers out there on Alamo Road going south and they're lost because they're following their GPS. If you don't fix that section of road, you will have a predictable surprise at some point, just like the Challenger, but don't lower your highway standards and accept that section of road. It's dangerous. It's the worst section of road it is. Please fund the project, do what's right, and don't have a predictable surprise. Thank you, sir. Carol Wilk. Elizabeth Parmenter, you're on deck. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. Um, as a Santa Fe Ranch property owner and resident of Mojave County, uh, I would like to start by thanking all of you for your continued support of this vital uh, Mojave County project. Um, Alamo Road, also known as Mojave County Highway 15, uh, the phase two improvement project has been decades in the making. Um, many of us, a number of years ago, uh, went to the then Transportation, Transportation Commission and a meetings on numerous occasions and uh, to encourage the commission and the board of supervisors to prioritize, secure, and apply the funding necessary to complete this project. There's a lot of work that went into this on both the part of the community and uh, the commission and then also with the board of supervisors. I know that um, this road is also part of the um, uh, <coughs> 
Arizona Peace Trail. It's a scenic route designated by the state. Uh, it in, that alone, if you go out and you look at uh, like MojaveCountyHighways.com and so forth, they refer people to this area on a regular basis. I know that Supervisor Johnson played a, a role in getting that um, uh, scenic route designated uh, back in the day. It goes through several counties. Um, I would just like to uh, encourage you not to back away from this now. We've come so far with it. Uh, we've seen an increase in available resources to those of us who are living out there, who uh, want to build, who want to do improvements to our property. Uh, delivery of water uh, has improved because it's not as rough on the trucks. But this isn't just about our, our community out there. This actually helps Lake Havasu with people who travel through there to go to Phoenix. It does the same thing for people coming from Kingman, Bullhead. This is a county-wide project that benefits everybody in the county, not just the local community. So I don't want to see it undersold as just a little community improvement for Santa Fe Ranch because it goes so far beyond that. And I have faith that the supervisors will stick with the original plan that was approved and um, make this, this project happen. Uh, for the betterment of everybody in the county. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, ma'am. Elizabeth Parmenter. Elizabeth Parmenter. Paul Parmenter. Okay. Tim Karua. Hope I'm saying that right. Excuse me, Tim Krug. Hi, I'm Tim Krug, and um, I live in Yucca, and known Ron for, I don't know, probably 17 years, and, but uh, I'd like to thank you supervisors and staff and county manager for uh, coming out in, uh, to our community and uh, making this a, a project. Um, we've been looking forward to it. Um, it is a, a collector road. It is a Sini County Highway identified as Highway 15. And, um, you know, we've been, this uh, uh, board's been approving developments out there, including the new retreat. Uh, I bought in this property um, over 17 years ago because I loved Alamo Lake and loved going out there. Well, Let's see, I've told my boat a couple times going down there. I've told my trailer. Um, um, we've all had, uh, all of us people have all had a lot of road damage that is here. I think uh, uh, Supervisor Gould, I think you broke an axle, uh, two axles. And uh, I've broken several springs. I've broken shocks. Uh, I bought a brand new travel trailer a couple of years ago. and. Before I got to the highway, the whole front of my travel trailer uh, fell off of my trailer and I tried to drive slow. Every time I take this route, I'm repairing my travel trailer. I do like to go camping, but I, I call up uh, Steve uh, Lutowski. He's a great guy. You guys got a good public works director. I really like the guy. He's real responsive. But, uh, you know, I call him up and say, what, is this road going to be graded so I can get out of here? Um, we've had people in motorhomes that have lost their front windshields. Um, I stop and help everyone. If I see somebody broken down, it's a uh, part of my nature. And I'm, I am Alaskan. And in Alaska, if we pass somebody, we can actually be arrested. So we do need to stop and help people. I've towed people. I've, uh, I've actually, right now, I got one of my vehicles loaned to somebody. And they're running all over Arizona and California just so they can sell some cactus. So, and um, you've listened to one of our mechanics out there. He's constantly repairing things. Um, so anyhow, we do have 3,000 properties in our PO, Property Owners Association. We do have an organization that keeps having events going on known as Mesquite Ranch. Uh, nothing seems to ever be enforced there. And that means a lot of trailers are coming out, a lot of ATVs are coming out. I, I'm all pro ATVing. Um, you know, if you buy, 
pay for insurance and a license plate, you can ride on the roads, you, but you should respect how you treat the roads too. Um, but anyhow, I'd like to continue thanking you for putting this on the six-year plan. And uh, many of us have, um, okay, well, it's, I think you get the point that we're all just a little bit upset over this uh, issue. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> William Bishop. Don Overman, you're on deck. Good afternoon, folks. Well, I guess everybody knows that Alamo Road's a disaster, and it has been. And it, and it gets graded with flour, okay? You pull the flour out on one side, you brush it across the road, you're done grading it. Three days later, it doesn't look any different. There's a thing like water, <laughs> bad subject. But we're not taking the time to do this stuff right. These 27 dips in the road could be 14. When they're close together, they need to be one long flat place for the water to go across and go back into the natural drainage on the other side at a shallow lower rate. There's just nobody understanding how this is working. You know, it's not working. And as far as the new section that we're, you know, we're really in dire need of, um, there's a lot more dirt work to be done on that because it wasn't in the shape of the last paved job that we got paved about this time last year. There's a lot more ditch work, shoulder work, you know, dirt to be moved. And they did a good job on it the last time, but they let the gravel get all tore up. We ran on the gravel until it was almost as bad as dirt. And then they come in and skimmed it and put the chip and seal down. And chip and seal's not as good as it should have been if they would have done it right away. But um, I mean, uh, we really need it, you know, I mean, uh, uh, I don't know what to tell you guys, you know, uh, if you drove on it every day, you'd understand. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bless you. Don Overman. Good afternoon. My name is Don Oberman. I have resided at 17388 Southmont via Montoya Road in Yucca, Arizona for the past 13 years. I have witnessed an increase in development in the development that has contributed to an increase in traffic on Alamo Road. The increase in development includes the new Pride Transportation Hub, the new Indian Restaurant, the newly planned 187 RV Space Recreation Facility, the new Health Retreat on Box Canyon Road, Rocket Burger, Areas 66 Museum, Shed King, as well as the rapid acquisition of homes and parcels in skates and stagecoach trails. In addition, there are numerous organized UTV and Jeep ride rides that occur on Alamo Road weekly. Also, there are many construction vehicles that use Alamo Road on a daily basis. Construction costs never go down, and the 1.2 million of additional monies that are needed to complete the project does not seem out of line, especially when you look at the other bid for the project that was 3.3 million. I am fairly certain that other paving projects in Mojave County will move forward and that future bids will doubtless be higher. Given that our area is severely underserviced and experienced past instances where monies destined for road paving were reallocated to other areas of the county, there is a level of irate citizenry on the ranch. I'm in favor of authorizing the transfer of HERF contingency funds to complete the previously approved project. Thank you for your attention to this matter. Thank you, sir. Director Lutowski, do you want to come up? Mm -hmm. 
I know this is listed under the procurement director, but perhaps you want to explain what's going on. Yes, uh, Chairman Lingenfelter, members of the board, um, staff had undergone and uh, first a, a programming with the support of the uh, Board and Transportation Commission of uh, constructing 3.79 miles of uh, Alamo Road. Now this is from Santa Fe Ranch Parkway on over to um, um, about uh, 3.79 miles. Uh, La Cienega uh, is the uh, cross street. Um, we programmed this uh, project originally at $1.3 million. Uh, that was prefaced on, you know, staff uh, uh, having some access to some real recent uh, data, uh, such as Shinrub Drive hard surfacing and some other recent hard surfacing projects. When we got into this project and undertook a uh, engineering uh, of the uh, work, including drainage analysis, and we actually had a consultant, Rick Engineering, perform all of the uh, requisite engineering. It really came to to, to, to light that uh, the level of uh, improvements to create a resilient roadway. Uh, again, this is a roadway that our intent is designed to perform. You know, under you know expected storm conditions, uh, we just didn't want to run out and build something uh, uh, and uh, find out that on the next very next storm, uh, it's going to blow out and then the costly repairs ensue. So, uh, it did arise. Uh, you know, in combination with the uh, uh, construction environment right now and the inflationary pre pre uh, pressures, uh, it's going to arise to be a project of uh, about $2.55 uh, uh, million. Uh, that includes about $260,000 that we have to budget to perform the hard surfacing work. Now, the scope of the, the, the entire project is such that we're providing for eight low water crossings and 21 culvert crossings. Um, the spread of those improvements are pretty uniform through the project throughout the whole 3.79 miles. So even though if the board were to decide to downscope the project, we would have to obviously resolicit, do a formal solicitation again, but just to get a feel for how those costs would fare if we were to downscope. Uh, if we were to take it to say Pearl Heart, which is a, a section line, it'd be about 1.1 miles. Uh, that estimate, you know, just straight line estimate would be about $800,000. Um, if we take it all the way out to Calamity Jane, uh, which does provide some access to some other developed properties in the Yucca area, that's about 2.36 miles, but it would be over budget at 1.7 million. So staff uh, has acknowledged that if this project were to move forward, We'd be looking at about a $1.3 million HERF contingency transfer. I know we had to have the uh, uh, budget workshop coming up on Wednesday. You will see in the public works budget, our current forecast for the HERF, uh, HERF cash on hand is trending at about $9.5 million. That does not account for uh, the yet to be determined cost of Mountain View Road construction. That project has not been bid yet. Um, 9.5 million is really at the low end of where I'd like to be comfort-wise uh, in administering the uh, you know, HERF uh, funds. Um, and to go below that um, you know, is not uh, exactly where staff plans to ever budget. But uh, again, just making you aware that uh, the implications uh, would be to even lower further by $1.3 million. I'll stop there and uh, take any questions. Thank you, Steve. Questions for the Supervisor Bishop? Steve, what would be the cost to just uh, bring some new material out there and resurface the dirt road uh, with better gravel? Um. Chairman Lingenfeld or Supervisor Bishop, uh, that could be handled through an in-house effort. Uh, that would be quite labor intensive. We're right now in our chip season. Uh, we'd have to plan for uh, the hauling resources necessary. Uh, perhaps we can try to look at something like that in the fall time frame when we're not chip sealing or hauling material for our uh, next uh, round of uh, chip seal work in the spring. So uh, we could probably handle that all in-house. We don't have the material right now. Um, we would have to look at uh, uh, see about producing uh, some gravel material probably at our Shinnerum pit pit for a rather lengthy haul, but not impossible. It's uh, the Shinnerum pit is where we base our hauling operation for the uh, first phase of Alamo Road. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Mr. Chair. Sorry, Supervisor Angus. Um, you mentioned Mountain View project, in, it's in the queue. It, would this disrupt that? 
Um, Chairman Lingenfelter, Supervisor Bishop, um, we have forecasted what we think Mountain View Road will come in at. Again, I just preface that I don't know what the actual low bid will be. Um, so uh, we, we have built in, when I mentioned that nine and a half million dollars, uh, that does account for what staff currently estimates Mountain View Road will come in. But again, it, it, if it comes in higher, that would be even more drawdown on the contingency. Thank you. Supervisor Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Lutowski, have you done a vehicle count on that road? Uh, Chairman Lingenfelter, uh, super, uh, <laughs> Chairman Lingenfelter, Supervisor Bishop, yes. Uh, staff did go out and uh, perform a count last month on the uh, section to be considered. Uh, the count was 171 vehicles per day. Uh, to compare that with the phase one, phase one, which is uh, before Santa Fe Ranch Road, which ties into Butch Cassidy, which largely serves uh, the greater population of that Santa Fe Rancho's community, uh, that was 574 vehicles per day. So it goes from 574 to 171 a day. Isn't the number that we used was 400 car count before we start <laughs> paving roads? Um, Supervisor Johnson, uh, there's a lot of coughing, but I think what I, what I heard uh, is, uh, yes, uh, Mojave County adopts the uh, AASHTO uh, design policy uh, for geometric design of highways and streets, and AASHTO defines uh, low volume roads by using a threshold of 400 vehicles per day. So anything under 400 is generally considered a low volume road and reasonably can function you know, as a gravel road. There's always some caveats with regard to truck traffic traffic, et cetera, but uh, generally 400 is our threshold. I think it's something we need to look at because if you open the door up, you're going to open it up for every other area that wants, you know, that has the same concerns that these people have. That's all, Mr. Chair, Mr. Mitoski, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. Supervisor Bishop. Yes, yeah, so it, in taking all of this into consideration, I think Eventually, uh, we're gonna need to pave this road. There's no doubt, but uh, I don't think the time is now, especially with the low volume count. Um, I drove out there a few days ago and, uh, and I passed four cars going in, drove around a little bit, and then uh, returning back to I-40, I passed five cars. So, of course, this was the middle of the day. I know the traffic's heavier in the morning and in the evening, but as I was driving out there and looking around, you could see five or six residences from Alamo Road. Um, but there, the, I know there's residences out there that I couldn't see. So I came back to the office and I looked at the GIS and, and there's really not the, the population out there that you would think that we would spend an additional 1.3 million to, to pave a road to. So um, I don't know, I, I, I'm having a hard time justifying this in my own mind when District 4 uh, has a higher population, a higher number count, and you know, their dirt roads are even worse than, than what Alamo could, has ever been. And we, we just have a really big, heavy need for, um, for improvements on our road system throughout Mojave County, but specifically in District 1 and District 4. I think in District 5, this is the only area that is really needy. And, you know, I hear people that, that tell me they moved to the Yucca area to stagecoach out there because they enjoyed the peace and the quiet and, and the lack of traffic. And, and now they're saying they're, they have so much traffic they want their road paved, so I'm not buying that. Um, this, if we do pave this road in the future, uh, it opens up a lot more to public works because now all these unapproved roads that intersect uh, Alamo Road will, will be wanting to get improved too. And I just don't think the county has the money at this, at this time to go forward with it. Um, I know there's some people out there that, that have, have their homes and have investment properties and this will increase the value of their homes. But I don't think that's a justification to pave the road either. So um, I, I will be opposed to this. Thank you, Supervisor. Steve, I've got one question for you. Um, I think what Supervisor Johnson brought up as far as the county or that you have brought up, you know, adopting the AASHTO standard. Um, when you have such a large, geographically large county and 
never enough money, you have to adopt some sort of a standard, right? Um, in the scope of work, in the program that was bid out, you mentioned two sections. One section you said was uh, experiencing over 500 cars a day, and then another section which was maybe 140? 171. 171, excuse me. Um, was the section that was re receiving over 500 cars a day, was that included in what was bid out in, in the total project? Uh, Chairman Lingenfelter, that's the section that we did last year. That was the so-called phase one that, that's completed okay. right now at the Santa Fe Ranch Parkway. So so we bid out a, a scope um, where there, there was an engineer's estimate of 1.3, just under 1.3 yes. million, and then it came in significantly higher than that, right? And y yes, to, to clarify, uh, the uh, staff um, estimate, staff estimate, the opinion of costs, as I like to say, uh, was $1.3 million when we adopted it uh, under the five-year program. It actually was $1.25 million in the Public Works FY23 budget, which was approved. And again, staff drew from you know past experiences with hard surfacing Shinrock Road and other similar roads in the county. It wasn't until the engineering work was actually completed, the engineering analysis, drainage, et cetera, that we realized this was a much more intensive project uh, and improvements uh, that were required. All right. Um, so for the the programmed funding, we have 1.3 approximately million program. 1.25. Yes. Road right now. Yes. Um, what type of a scope could we accomplish for what's currently programmed? That 1.3 million dollars. <laughs> Chairman Lingenfelter, as I mentioned from the top, I, I do see this uh, as more of a uniform spread of improvements throughout the entire uh, roadway. So um, we could probably accomplish uh, $1.25 million uh, by doing um, um, roughly about half the project. Um, I, I kind of said, you know, if you determine like break points such as Pearl Heart, the section line, you know, a straight line, you know, uh, you know, estimate would be about $800,000 uh, total, which would be well under budget. So we could actually take it a little bit further to maybe about doing about 1.6, 1 1.7 you know, miles, uh, which is about half the, half the project. So we have enough funds on hand in the budget to do about half, but we would want our engineer to go back and uh, actually determine what that break point would be. Well, I, as a compromise and not to take the wind completely out of everybody's sails out there, perhaps option three where we would direct staff to cancel the current solicitation and then reduce this, the project scope to come in at what is currently budgeted might be an option. That way, I mean, it's at least some improvements. Some improvements are better than no improvements, in my opinion. That's all I have. That's Supervisor Gould. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me address a couple of things. Bear in mind, this is a county highway. Um, so I don't know that it opens the floodgates to paving other roads with a count of less than 400 because unless they were a county highway, they're not at the same designation. Um, Supervisor Bishop mentioned hauling in material. Um, that's problematic because when it rains, the wash flows for about a mile and a half right down Alamo Road. It comes in from the east, it hits the road, travels on the road for about a mile and a half, and then it goes, exits on the west side. So anything that you haul in there is just gonna wash away. So that's really uh, just good money after bad. Um, this is a problematic section of the road. It um, becomes almost impassable if we have an, a normal monsoon season. And we saw a bit of that when we had a normal monsoon season this last year. Um, people have trouble getting in and out of there. And it, it is a county highway. It does go on through Chicken Springs Road over to um, what's gonna be Interstate 11 at some time. It also goes on to Alamo Lake. And it might be nice to see some actual development on the Mojave County side at Alamo Lake. Because currently there is nothing there. Um, it, the road dies into the lake, essentially. There's just, there's nothing there. Uh, but um, it is, a, it's been a, a really a bad section of road. And really the, and just from the count, it, and. I think it's 29 uh, low water crossings. You could even count more of that. It just depends on how you count. You can't really combine those together because you're going to end up combining them on private land right. that we're then going to have to eminent domain. <laughs> and I, I don't think that uh, that cost benefit analysis works. I think you need to put those crossings in there. Um, but it is an important project to the people in my district. It's an important project to my neighbors. Um, 
then I'd like to see it go forward. So I'm gonna go ahead and make a motion and I move that we award contract 23 uh, 817 Alamo Road, phase two, and authorize the Hearth Contingency Fund transfer. For that motion. Steve, I've got one more question. Um, sort of piggybacking on Supervisor Angus's question. Um, if this project moves forward, do you see it negatively impacting the Mountain View Road construction project? Um, Chairman Lingenfelter, um, we would ultimately bring back uh, any ramifications of the Mountain View Road bid in terms of a like, contingency transfer back to the board for a business decision. So it would be up to the board, you know, again, to uh, consent to a, any kind of contingency transfer if needed for Mountain View Road. Um, but to answer your question more distinctly, um, uh, we're committed uh, to Mountain View Road. We have federal funds that are partially, you know, funding the project. So uh, uh, we are actually, you know, you know, committed to, to move ahead on Mountain View Road. So I, I do not see, you know, this project, uh, you know, compromising that. It's just the board needing to know that this would draw down our contingency uh, even further, uh, taking nine and a half down to in the low eights, you know, for cash on hand. And my last question, um, how long has this road been designated as the county highway? Oh, County Highway 15. Um, I am almost certain, Chairman Lingenfelter, that this was part of the core county highways that were established. There was an engineering report that was done in the early 70s uh, that established the backbone county highway uh, system. And I'm almost positive Alamo Road, CR Nut 15, was on that list. So it was probably, again, early 70s when that was one of the core county highways that was established. Thank you. Uh, we have a motion on the floor. Do I have a second? I'll second it. For that motion and second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. You guys know, appear to have it. We do have it, so ordered. Thank you, board. We'll go to uh, item 33, although no action is required on item 33. Is that correct, Attorney Eslin? Bless you all. Chairman uh, Flingenfelter, we are also actually asking the board to move to authorize the Mojave County Attorney's Office to proceed as instructed in the executive session. Thank you, sir. Do I have that? Do I have a motion? So moved. You've heard that motion. Do I have a second? Second. For that motion, second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? You guys appear to have it. Do have it. So ordered. Item 34, Director Gutowski. Motion to approve. Chairman Lingenfelter, members of the board, just acknowledge and referral. Second. Thank you. Before that motion, second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. I'm here to have it. You have it so ordered. Item 35. <coughs> yes, same thing, acknowledge and refer a petition. Thank you. You've heard that motion. Do I have a second? Second. For that motion, second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. Ayes appear to have it. Do you have it so ordered? Item 36. Motion to approve. For that motion, do I have a second? Second. For that motion, second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. You guys appear to have it. Do have it, so ordered. Item 38, Director Morian. Director Morian, excuse me. Good afternoon, Chairman Lingenfelter, members of the board. This item uh, is being brought back to you at your request. Uh, there were some questions asked at the last board meeting. Uh, I attached a memorandum in the backup, but I wanted to quickly walk through and make sure that all those questions get answered to your satisfaction. Uh, the first question was just how are the special district reimbursements communicated to districts, specifically fire districts? Our overall process is to bring these reimbursements in front of the board in the springtime, relatively early on in the budgeting process. And uh, once the board approves the rates, we then communicate those rates to the districts in the form of a letter that details what the amount is for each district and, and when that money would be due to the county. Uh, second question that was asked is what is the legal framework for the special district reimbursement? It's governed by ARS 11-250-106. Uh, county Attorney Esplin has 
has uh, included his opinion in the backup as well. The third question was, what is the history of this item and how has it been working since 2003? 2003 is when the, the board at that time originally exempted fire districts from, from the reimbursements for special districts. Uh, the statute changed in 2005. As you remember, we, we discussed last time, the wording went from uh, may reimburse to shall reimburse. And in 2008, the county attorney's office uh, put a, put a action in front of the board, uh, which had a hourly rate schedule. That rate schedule was approved. It was reapproved in 2013 with the rates being revised and updated, and it has been in place since. Uh, in actuality, uh, as far as we are aware, no fire districts have actually been charged under that rate schedule just because of the the, the hourly rate structure doesn't really line up with the with the services that the at least the treasurer's office and the assessor's office provide for sending out tax bills and that sort of thing. Uh, another question that was posed, and this one I do want to spend a little bit of time on, is do other Arizona counties require reimbursement from their fire districts? I reached out to finance directors, chief financial officers around the state. I heard back from a good number of other counties, and their responses really fall into four different categories as far as how do they charge or do they charge fire districts for reimbursement. The first category, uh, four counties responded that they use a similar cost allocation methodology to where they use a per parcel basis for billing those county or those fire districts for reimbursement. Two of those four counties noted that they actually engaged an outside CPA firm to uh, conduct a cost allocation study. Uh, one of them was willing to share what their cost was for that. It was $30,000 each year that they engaged the professional services firm to perform that study. Um, the second group of respondents uh, did not use cost allocation. Instead, they used a discrete per item or per service charge structure. Some of the things that they, they charged for uh, non-tax related services would be things like the, the number of warrants that a fire district was clearing through that county's treasurer's office. Uh, we had... Two counties respond that they use both of those in concert, so they do a per parcel charge and then they also charge for those discrete services. And then we had, uh, I believe it was two counties that said, no, we do not currently request reimbursement from fire districts. However, we're very interested in the discussion and we're gonna be keeping an eye on it to see, see where it goes. And then finally, uh, the last question that was posed was, can we reduce the rate and still be following statute? Uh, my response to that is that the statute says actual costs, and so that is what we've based our cost allocation on, on the actual costs that are incurred. And with that, I'm happy to answer any other questions from the board. Thank you. Supervisor Angus. Thank you. So we haven't been charging the fire districts this money. And, you know, you have brought up the fact that we would be out of compliance with state statute. But, um, as, but now we're finding out a lot of other counties would be as well. And what I want to know is, what is the consequence if we're out of compliance? What is the state going to do? Is the attorney general, after 20 years, the attorney general has never knocked on our door. But... Who, who's the harmed party? We're the harmed party. So if we're making the decision for ourselves, basically to harm ourselves, who's going to do anything about it? I mean, the whole state statute saying it shall doesn't make any sense, frankly. I, I don't understand. Um, and interestingly enough, I did a little background investigating as, uh, about this and where the derivation of it. And it seems like it came from Mojave County. Did anyone know that? In 2005, it was it was uh, put through um, by someone. I won't go into names, but I thought that was interesting. And then, so they they did that shall, and then we went ahead and we said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to exclude it. And the fire districts do a lot for the county, and don't build back. 
And I, I think I said this last time, I have a little piece of county in my district, you know, as everyone knows, my district is incorporated. But um, they, they go and respond to calls there. And I always said, well, who, how do you get reimbursed for that? And no one ever was able to kind of tell me. And until I saw this, then it made sense to me. Um, why we do we do waste, uh, hazardous waste um, events for the county the fire district does and so it's kind of this unsaid handshake between the fire districts and the county that we're not going to charge you this I mean they do get charged part of it is for the elections they get charged for elections when there's an election year the county charges the fire districts to hold their elections. So that's a big part of this whole, you know, thing here. I don't know if this was meant to all be separate, but it's part of it and they do charge. So I wanted to let people know about that. So I, I'm not, I, I'm just not for upsetting the apple cart. We're all looking for money and I appreciate um, Mr. Morney and you going and, and looking and being out for the best interest of the county. I get it, but there are some things that, that are more important than a few bucks. And I think the good relationships between the fire districts and, and the county is one of those. So uh, I will not be supporting this. Thanks. Thank you. Chairman Lingenfilter, uh, Supervisor Angus, I, I, I can't argue with your logic about the county would be the, the party that is harmed if, if we don't enforce uh, this and request reimbursement. Uh, I'm not sure that there would be any repercussion. Not legally, I would leave that to Attorney Esplin to opine on. But as far as the, the elections, that charge is separate from what, from it, it's included in the schedule of charges that the fire district reimbursement, uh, I think the sticking point that we've had has been the treasurer and the assessor charges that are billed out per parcel. Um, so it, it's, it's somewhat the same, but also somewhat separate. So I just wanted to make that clarification. Other comments from the board? Mr. Chair. Supervisor Johnson. I believe it was 2003 that this came about and I was a no vote on that. So the side eye glances aren't gonna get me on that one. Uh, this was done at that time because uh, the members of the board decided that the fire districts came forward and said they would find unassessed properties and places that had additional building to them that we were missing and that was the reason that that came about. But I, I think, you know, maybe just going on with today, we're going to you know, not tax the, or not collect from the fire districts who, like the school districts and everybody else, pay this. We're making a mistake if we don't do this. That's all, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Other comments? Supervisor Bishop. I would be in support of this if we could put it off a year and give the fire departments an opportunity to prepare for it. Although I don't think um, some of the smaller fire departments are going to be able to prepare for it, even if we give them extra time. So, but that's something I, I might be able to support. Yeah, Luke, I, I appreciate your research. Um, when you look at Supervisor Bishop's district and my district, um, by far the most parcels. And so I'm not sure if a per parcel thing is really equitable. I know that Supervisor Bishop brought that up in our last meeting. I see that some of them are doing uh, per occurrence and things like this, um, you know, where you're actually basing something on occurrence, you know, maybe that's a little more equitable. I don't know, but I haven't seen any numbers for that. Chairman Lingenfelter, one thing that certainly I, th I think the treasurer's office can uh, tell us how many warrants each fire district clears through the counties, uh, through the treasurer's office. That is something where we could uh, try to develop a per item charge for. Um, as far as what Supervisor Bishop said, putting it, putting it off a year, but also recognizing that the districts that have a higher parcel count may be disproportionately affected. Uh, one thing that we could do uh, is to take the next several months. Part of the discussion we heard last meeting from the fire districts was that, you know, they may be further along in their budgeting process than we are at this point. They don't, some of them say they've already passed their budgets. They don't have time to adjust. And so if we were to approve a rate schedule today and then spend the next, 
uh, you know, until the end of this calendar year, perhaps, to really try and dial in what the charges are. Uh, dial in is not the not the right word. We've we've already done the study, but if we were to ask the the treasurer's office, the assessor's office, to take the time to try and and really specify how many hours uh, is it taking to produce tax bills countywide and then figure out what what is the actual hour number of hours that we can we can charge um, that might come up with a different number uh, it, it may be more equitable it may not I, I really can't can't tell you sure I appreciate that but I think it's for me, I think it'd be important to go through an exercise like that. One of the things that struck me as odd the last time we talked about this and reaching out and talking to some of the fire chiefs is the fact that they got caught flat footed. That, you know, I like to think that if you want somebody in on the landing, they're gonna be in on the takeoff, right? And we wanna be good partners. And so you involve our our partnerships with, with saying, hey, you know, we're looking at this scenario, you know, per occurrence or per parcel, and you, you kind of involve them in it and you just don't, um, surprise somebody with something, you know, with a week notice or something like that. You know, that's, I don't think that's a good way to do business. So I think that um, continuing to look at it and involving all of our partners is a better way to go about it. Chairman Lingfelter, I, I can appreciate that. I, I, we certainly did not look at it as, as one week's notice. The rates were to go into effect July 1st, but I, I can appreciate, you know, the position of the fire districts and, you know, where they're at in their budgeting process. Um, Great. Mr. Chair. Supervisor Johnson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Monaghan. Was this done by uh, state legislature? Chairman Lingenfelter, Supervisor Johnson, you mean the statutory revision? Right. Yes. So the fire districts have a lobbying firm, which is probably bigger than ours, and they had the same notification that we have. So to say that they're caught unaware, they either have the worst lobbying firm or they just didn't care. So I'm not going to use that as an excuse for them. Sure. Supervisor Angus. Yeah, well, um, I, I appreciate that, Supervisor uh, Johnson. But the fact of the matter is, is we haven't done it for 20 years. It's been on the books, but we haven't done it. So, you know, uh, the time period and letting people know, we're all starting from the same place. And, and another, another thing is that, um, should, should we do this? And again, everyone's looking for money. What's to stop this fire districts from, you know, billing us for everything that they do for us? Uh, I'm not saying that's going to happen, but if that's sort of now the bar, we're all just, you know, looking out for ourselves and our budgets and, and whatever. I just want to say that could happen. And I think that would be an unfortunate thing on both parties. Just wanted to bring it up. Sure. Supervisor Johnson. Can you explain what the fire districts do for the county? Could you repeat that? What, what, does the, what does the fire districts do for the county? Um, I mean, for, for the county itself, for the board here. I, I would not speak for the fire district, but I know that there's um, Chief Moore's here. If he wants to talk about that, maybe. Well, I don't want to drag him into our internal <laughs> fights, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, their fire department, they go out and they put out fires and they do the inspections and those sorts of things. But as far as the county itself, and obviously Chief Moore and all the other chiefs are gonna say, hey, they need their money, just like we need our money. But I think it's a decision on, on our part to decide if we're gonna you know, let, let the residents pay for this. You know, people in my district and the rest of the districts pay for the fire districts. So as Bishop. Maybe this is a legislative issue that needs to be handled by our representatives and change the wording on this law. But right now it says that we shall do that. And I know in law enforcement, may means you have discretionary options and shall means that you have to do it. So um, I'm hopeful that this HB 2803 comes through and that's going to provide 150 million 
for fire districts and maybe buy some time while we figure out whether or not to change this legislatively or find a way to, to pay the counties the, the rate that legally they're supposed to. And just because we haven't been doing it since 2003, uh, the other end of that spectrum is look at all the money the fire department has not paid us since 2003. So, I don't know. It's not an easy, it's not an easy answer. Chairman Lingenfelter, uh, board members, what, what I can offer is that the, the statute does say shall, it says we shall publish a schedule for reimbursement uh, prior to June 1st for the following fiscal year. Um, so we have one more board meeting before the 1st of June and what, what we can do is certainly go back and calculate what the hourly rate would be for the treasurer's office and for the assessor's office. Update that rate schedule so that it includes hourly charges. We still will have the same difficulty uh, that we've had since 2008 when that fee schedule was originally put in place that it's very difficult to determine the number of hours, but we'll at least have the first half of the equation. Uh, and then as I said, we can, we can try and dial that in a little bit more uh, prior to the end of the calendar year and bring this back to the board much earlier uh, before the fire districts have, have walked too far down their budgeting path for fiscal 25. Is there any interest in hearing from Chief Moore standing in the back or no? I have another question for Mr. Monaghan if you... Supervisor Johnson. Are you looking at uh, back taxes, collection of those two? Chairman Lingenfilter, Supervisor Johnson, uh, what do you mean by collection of back taxes? Well, if we haven't been collecting it since, what, 2008, do they owe us all that money? I believe that would be at the board's discretion. It's not, it's not taxes, so to speak. It's just reimbursement for services. Mr. Chairman. Manager Elthers. If I may, I wish to not uh, comment on whether we should or should not. I'm not speaking for or against, but as far as the methodology for invoicing, uh, we've had a lot of discussions since the last board meeting when, when the board directed us to uh, do some follow-up. Uh, the concern with establishing hourly rate and then billing on those basis is that you you would establish hourly rate, bring it to the board, get approval for it, and then the way to establish the amount, you would take the time it takes, multiplied by the rate that the board approves, um, and establish an invoice to send to the fire departments. That is as challenging in my mind and allow me to tell you why this really is not an assembly line where you have a beginning and an end. We generate those tax bills. We, for everybody, we send them out. They don't come in all at one time where you can stop and start. They come in, we process them, and then we, we distribute the funds accordingly as they come in. So if there is a question about the equitability of the process, I, I'm submitting to you that determining the time it takes for each district would be probably as questionable as the method that uh, was presented to the board at the last board meeting. If indeed um, time is needed to allow the districts to uh, plan for it and, and integrate uh, this into their budgets, uh, we can certainly be accommodating and, and the board may consider that. My, my really suggestion to you is to keep that in mind and the, the method that we proposed is, um, is more, um, reasonable when when you think of it than uh, the alternatives. And so I, I, I'm not speaking for or against, I just wanted to clarify that point. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It's a pleasure of the board.
Chairman Langenfelter, while the board is is contemplating this, I, I would just note that there are other charges on the on the schedule that do need to be published. So, uh, regardless of what the decision is pertaining to the fire districts, we do need a, a vote on on publishing some sort of fee schedule that includes those other services. Thank you, Luke. One six seven. Motion to approve. Motion to approve. Heard that motion. Do I have a second? Second. Heard that motion and second. Any other comments? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? No. No. Motion fails. <laughs> Do I have an alternative motion? Um, I make a motion that we ex exempt or exclude the fire districts from this reimbursement schedule. It's not going to work. <laughs> That's not it. Attorney Esplin, what would, what would the, uh, the board motion need to be to exclude the fire districts as Supervisor Angus is proposing to do, but at the same time adopt all the other necessary fees that uh, Finance Director Mornian has spoken about? Oh, I, I don't understand what other fees that we would be adopting. The, the uh, motion says adopt the rate of $1,6113 per parcel. Um, I don't know what else, the, what else the Finance Department needs. Confused too. I guess I don't understand. <laughs> I thought that that's what they were seeking was to Mr. adopt Chair? that rate. Mr. President Angus. So uh, did you say elections? Because elections is separate. That's a whole separate fee. It's not, it's not included. They, they pay that anyway under a separate. Chairman Liebenfelter, Supervisor Angus, the fire district schedule for reimbursement that's included is Exhibit A in the backup, and that includes the per parcel charges for the assessor and treasurer, as well as the combined voter registration election elections charges, um, there's an hourly charge for finance services, there's charges for the recorder as well. Okay, okay. I see it, yeah. Okay, okay, so right now, the fire districts pay, a, they paved the cost of holding their elections. Are you saying that that would be incorporated into this per parcel fee? Supervisor Angus, no, that the per parcel fee for the treasurer and assessor services is just for the services of those two departments, but the proposed fire district reimbursement schedule that is part of this. So, so what the supervisor could do is say motion to approve the rate of services provided by the assessor and the treasurer. <laughs> is that correct? In order to adopt the services that are the rate schedule for the assessor and the treasurer, a motion that would cover those and just leave the fire district services out? I'm confused. So you would, you would need to adopt the schedule for reimbursement uh, and ex exclude the line items for the assessor and the treasurer. Thank you, sir. But this is just for the fire district. I, I, I'm now very confused about what exactly we're voting on today. You always just vote no and bring them something back more specific <laughs> next time. Can make that motion. Yeah. What what I've what I've placed on, on the on the podium is the complete schedule. So right. there's and there's a line item for the assessor and the treasurer. Those would need it, you would be approving it absent those items. But I don't want to. I don't understand. I'm just saying that we, we just keep on what we're doing, which is not what we've excluded the fire district from these administrative costs. Supervisor Angus, there, there still needs to be a, a schedule. What we have updated this year was to include the, <coughs> the charges for the assessor and treasurer based on a per parcel. We, we still need to have an approved schedule. So Do I suppose you can, have one you, can, you can just leave, I guess the action could be to leave the previously approved schedule in place from 2013, the last time that it was approved by the board. Okay. 
<laughs> so can I make so, a stab at a motion that Mr. Might, Bishop. might work? <laughs> Mr. President Bishop. So um, my motion would be to approve this rate of one point. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We do have a motion on the floor that needs either a second or it needs to. This is, this is a recommendation. Right. But that wasn't what my motion was. Right. Let me tell you my recommendation because it might help. Okay. My recommendation would be to make a motion to approve the rate of 1.6113 per partial for the fire district's effective fiscal year 2024-2025. No, that's not what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. Do you wish to? I'm saying I want to stay the way that it is, basically. Yeah. Do we, we have a motion on the floor. Madam Kirk, can you re repeat the motion, please? Chairman Lingenfelter, I believe the motion is to not approve this and just keep right. it the to elections or what it was. To not approve this item and to keep things as they are. Correct. <laughs> All right, we have a motion. Do we have a second? I don't know that that works. Either. All right. <laughs> well, uh, I might not be saying it absolutely correctly, but I think everybody understands where I'm trying to go. The, withdraw your motion. I'll make it. Uh, I withdraw the, my the current motion. schedule that was approved in 2013 includes an hourly rate for the treasurer and the assessor. All right. That is what was approved back in 2013. How uh, it's what has been in place, but as I mentioned earlier, the problem has been that the county has not been reimbursed on that schedule because it's nearly right, here, impossible. Here's what we're going to do, okay? Um, do you, I'm, I'm going to take your... On my motion. Okay, we're, she's with her motion. Supervisor Gould, do you have a motion? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to direct the assessor and the treasurer to publish their fee, fire district fee schedule for reimbursement, excluding the collection of property taxes. Okay. For All that right. motion. I'll, I'll second that. All right. Any other discussion points on that motion? For that motion and second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. Aye. Nice to have it. You have it. So ordered. Thank you. Attorney Eslin, item number 39, do we need a motion on this? Uh, we're asking the board to move to authorize the Mojave County Attorney's Office to proceed as instructed in the executive session. Thank you, sir. Do I have a motion? So made. You heard, heard that motion, second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? You guys appear to have it. Do have it, so ordered. Item 40, Supervisor Johnson. Motion to approve. Second. You heard that motion, second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? You guys appear to have it. Do have it, so ordered. Item number 41. Supervisor Gould. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm having trouble getting checks to my small ARPA recipients that are not large enough to have people on staff to wade through a myriad of government paperwork. And we took a look at the rules and actually what's going on is um, staff is treating my, my uh, people that I'm granting money to as sub-recipients rather than beneficiaries. And the rules allow them to be treated as beneficiaries so they don't have to wade through that, they don't have to follow federal procurement rules. Um, and I've got like 20 and $80,000 grants where um, effectively they would have to follow Davis-Bacon Act also. And I, I just think that's ridiculous. And I think the board should determine um, that those um, small grantees be treated as beneficiaries rather than sub-recipients. Chairman uh, Lingenfelter. Attorney Eslin. So uh, I, I respect uh, Supervisor Gould's uh, position there, and I think I'd be happy, I, I'd be more than happy to go back and look at the various different decisions we've made. Supervisor Gould is correct. We've been treating them all as sub-recipients, when some of them could be uh, beneficiaries and some could be sub-recipients. Mm -hmm. The decision, though, cannot necessarily come directly from the board. We do need to follow whatever the guidance we have. And, and really, the, the distinguishing factor is, and, and I'm just reading directly from the rule itself, 
The distinction between a subrecipient and a beneficiary, therefore, is contingent upon the rationale for why a recipient is providing funds to the entity. If the recipient is providing funds to the entity for the purpose of carrying out the program, then the individual is a subrecipient. So if we're just a pass through, if we're saying, okay, we want to address this issue that, that ARPA says, and we're passing it on to them, then they have to continue to be a subrecipient. On the other hand, it says, if the recipient is providing funds to the individual or entity for the purpose of directly benefiting the individual, then they are a beneficiary. So, give you an example. If the nonprofit says, hey, I was directly impacted by COVID and this is what happened, then they would be a beneficiary. So we do have people, we do have entities that we have entered into agreements with where they could be beneficiaries. But we also have others that could be subrecipients. So we'd have to look at the programs to determine which ones are beneficiaries and which ones are subrecipients. What I'd be happy to do is I'd be happy to look back at some of these and say, hey, I'll come back here and say, I think this is a beneficiary or I think this is a subrecipient. And then we can, we can go from there and we can make modifications, if that makes uh, sense. That's what I would like to do because the ones that, I, that I'm thinking of are beneficiaries that are directly using that in their, in their facilities. They're not giving that money on to another third party. Yeah, so when I, when, for some of the analysis that I did, some of them I could argue are subrecipients, and so, but also beneficiary. Like I, I, we, when I analyzed each one, some of them were acting as subrecipients, but, some, but, but that same person was also acting as a beneficiary. So I, I'd be happy to look, look at them again and, and I can identify and say, okay, this is how this entity is a beneficiary or this is how this entity is a subrecipient and, and bring it back. So I mean, we contacted Lake Havasu City Finance that had uh, for about two weeks articles on who was getting their million dollars. These were all a bunch of social service groups, nonprofits. Um, so we actually contacted Havasu Finance, asked them had they actually gotten checks to these people or are they just thinking they're gonna get checks to these people? And they had actually direct deposited the money into the people's accounts already. So we might wanna take a look at what Havasu is doing to get their money out there in, instead of uh, what we're doing that's not getting the money out there. It's whatever the board wishes for us wishes for me to do. I'd be happy to look into the issue. So thank you. Are you entertaining a motion? I don't know that. Do we need to direct Ryan to take a look at it? Or <laughs> I don't think so. We can I take don't. no action, but I can bring it back and yeah, I can right. I try to identify some of the ones we've already worked with. I don't know if I can get them all, but I'll try to identify some of them and work with staff and try to get it back to either the next meeting or the meeting after. And so we don't need any action. Works for you. Okay, great. Uh, we'll move to. Item number 42. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I jumped the gun on this and we do not have the actual uh, uh, application to appeal. So I, I move that we continue this to our uh, May 15th, 23 meeting. For that motion, do we have a second? Second. For that motion, second. Hey, question, you, we sure this guy's gonna, shouldn't we just put it on the agenda if he files it? He didn't file it for this one. He showed up. Hadn't <laughs> done anything so far, but I mean, if he did, you want to do it. Well, I was just saying, okay. you're, you're moving it to the other thing. Why don't we just wait till we get it and you just put it on the agenda instead of, we can I mean, do maybe that. we'll show up. Take no action. We yeah. can do that also. No action is taken. Item 43, uh, Attorney Eslin, we need a, is this just an update? This is just an right. update. All right, thank you everybody, we're adjourned. 153. Yeah. 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 Ye